year for the Orioles and their fans. You know Cal Ripken's going to be in the lineup. He's got a new playmate in Roberto Alomar. It's the Indians and the Orioles next. ESPN Wednesday Night Baseball presents the Cleveland Indians and the Baltimore Orioles. Hi, everybody. Dan Schulman and Buck Martinez with you on what should be a great night of baseball. Indians and Orioles early, then the Braves and Dodgers late. Right now in Baltimore, it's a little bit cool. They're just taking the tarp off the field. This game's going to get underway in no time. And, Buck, the Cleveland Indians are used to this. They had a week up in Cleveland, some cold weather. Took their bats a while to get heated up as well. Well, it sure did. And manager Mike Hargrove felt like the players were somewhat preoccupied with the cold weather. Well, on Saturday against the Blue Jays, they broke out and really broke out on Sunday. They connected for four home runs, including Albert Bell with a pair. Here in the eighth inning against Mike Timlin, he gets a high fastball and drives it over the wall. The Indians are going to hit. They have an awesome lineup, and Mike Hargrove knows that it's just a matter of time until these bats really get going. And knowing that, the Baltimore Orioles got busy in the offseason. A new GM, new manager, new coaches, and a half dozen new players, including a second baseman. He'll make some plays. Well, Robbie Alomar comes to this ball club. Probably the best free agent signing in all the offseason. Alomar, a five-time gold glover, really adds to the middle of the defense. The Orioles led defensive, the defensive uh, league last year. They were outstanding, but Alomar gives them even more range. Plus, with the bat, he brings together a history of wearing out tonight's starter for the Indians, Jack McDowell. 552 with three homers and 80 RBIs. Robbie Alomar is a big addition to this Oriole ball club. And they're off to a quick 5 and one start. The Indians are 2-3. and three. This game will start in just a few minutes. We'll be back here in just a few minutes. First, let's check in after this with our ESPN studio. ESPN Wednesday Night Baseball is brought to you by your local Sherwin-Williams paint and decorating stores. Ask Sherwin-Williams, America's neighborhood place for paint. Gary, thank you. It is cold but dry. It looks like it'll stay that way for the rest of the evening. A brief shower passed, and hopefully no more rain will be in the area. Indians and Orioles tonight. Left-hander David Wells on the mound for Baltimore, and he will face this Indians lineup. Kenny Lofton not hitting a whole lot, but off and running five steals and five tries. Omar Vizquel moved from ninth up to second in the order. Carlos Baerga hitting over 300 early in the season. Albert Bell, his first two home runs of the season on Sunday. Eddie Murray, the DH again. Julio Franco, the new first baseman. Manny Ramirez homered on Sunday. Sandy Alomar behind the plate. And Scott Leyes, the right-handed batter in there against the lefty Wells tonight. Left-hander David Wells with a 16-8 record last year combined Detroit and Cincinnati. There you see his first start, April 3rd, against Kansas City. Seven strong innings, good control, just three walks, and he had six strikeouts in that game. Wells is better off when he comes right at this Indian ball club. Whenever he's able to get that fastball over early in the count, he has a good outing against the Indians. Defensively, the Orioles were best in the league last year. They got even better this year when they signed free agent Robbie Alomar. Five-time Gold Glover at second base. Teams up with two-time Gold Glover Cal Ripken at shortstop. Paul Mayer is outstanding at first. B.J. Serhoff is just now getting comfortable at third base, but Alomar is the key to their off-season dealings. He'll play alongside Cal Ripken, one of the best middle infields the game has seen in a long, long time, as David Wells starts Kenny Lofton with a strike here at Camden Yards. Lofton again, a slow start with the bat. The Indians score just three runs in their first three games. Down low, one and one. Uh, Kenny Lofton is the igniter of this offense. Look at B.J. Serhoff at third base. He's got to come in and take the fun away from Kenny Lofton, and that really gives Lofton an advantage when he slaps it toward left. Breaking ball is there, one and two. Lofton to be followed by Vizquel and by Erga here in the first inning. Wells going right after him, and Lofton fouls it off to stay alive. Well, that's the thing he needs to do against this aggressive lineup the Indians feature. Use the fastball. Be aggressive. Stay ahead. Use it early in the count. That gives David Wells a few more options. Fastball, curveball, it's a pretty good changeup. Ahead of Lofton, one and two. Breaking ball. Lofton hits it into left center field, and it'll drop for a base hit. 
Jeffrey Hammonds almost overruns it on the slick grass, but fires it back in to hold Lofton to a single. A good play by Hammonds is getting some instruction from Brady Anderson right now. He almost overran that ball. Curve ball stayed up in the zone with two strikes. Lofton's just trying to put it in play. He put a pretty good swing on that pitch. Take it to left field. Remember, it's been raining here, and the grass is wet and soft, so that ball really checked up on Jeffrey Hammonds, and he almost overran it. Hammonds getting a regular chance as the left fielder for the Orioles this season. An early test for Wells and Hoyles with probably the best base stealer in the game, Kenny Lofton at first, and a guy who knows how to hit in the number two spot, Omar Vizquel. It's Sirhoff creeping in, although not quite as tight as he was when Lofton was hitting. Lofton not going, and it's high for ball one to Vizquel. David Wells uses a very good slide step with great base runners on base like Lofton. He'll mix up his deliveries. He's got a pretty decent move to first base, but Kenny Lofton will have to be on his toes to make sure that Wells is going to the plate if he makes a break in second. Again, five steals and five tries in the early going here this season. The Indians, a little bit earlier, had changed their batting order. As you see, the dominance of Kenny Lofton since he became a regular player in 1992, way out in front of the field. Wells to the plate. Lofton leaning back to the bag there. That's all you want with a great base stealer like Kenny Lofton is indecision. David Wells has him going back to first base right here. He's not really sure which way Wells is headed. And with that, he is really nullifying the stolen base. He's got to continue to mix it up. Back to first again. Mentioning that the Indians changed their batting order. Originally, Omar Vizquel was down to the number nine spot, and Julio Franco was doing a little bit of hitting in the two spot. Now Franco's been moved down to sixth, and Vizquel up to second. He's mixing it up. He's done a good job. Stepped off, facing back. He's just got lost in thinking about his delivery now. Which way is he going? Coming to first. <laughs> walking a fine line with that left hip. Well, he's got to step toward first base. That's all he's got to do. Big lead for the Mets in the early going. Here's scoreless. Top of the first. A little bit delayed because of the weather. Kenny Lofton singled the lead off the game. Omar Vizquel sends one the other way. But foul into the seats down the right field line. Well, as you mentioned, Omar Vizquel is a very good number two hitter because he's patient, he's confident, he can still put the ball in play with a couple of strikes on it. He will enable Kenny Lofton an opportunity to run, and if Mike Hargrove feels that Lofton is going to go ahead and wait, he'll put the hit around and force the issue. Big season last year for Hargrove and his Indians. And even bigger expectations here in 96. time already well she checked on Lofton at first well the one thing that Lofton does he's a distraction and you as a pitcher have to guard against losing your focus to the hitter after you get by this skill you've got some real problems in this lineup there he goes Lofton on his way to second the scale lines one to center Brady Anderson the catch fires it back in and out at first is Kenny Lofton Uh, Mike Hargrove's out of the dugout. Davey Nelson, the first base coach, arguing with Larry McCoy. Nelson was really surprised when Lofton was called out at first base. Brady Anderson throwing on the run through a strike to first base. Hargrove trading his case with McCoy, who had to come out from home plate and make the call at first. Lofton says no way. Watch Lofton. He breaks for second base. This skill lifts it into shallow center, and watch Anderson throwing on the run. Mid-stride, he throws a strike to first base on the hop. Boy, bang, bang, I don't know. Let's take another look at it. 
Boy, it looked like he got his foot back on the base before the ball hit Palmero's glove, but McCoy had a long run down to first base. Boy, he got back. I'll tell you, though, whether he got back or didn't, he could have gotten back to first a little bit quicker. He didn't slide, and maybe the conditions had something to do with that, but he was slowing himself down three or four strides away from first. Yeah, he actually broke it down about five feet away from the bag, and that made the play much closer than it could have been. The batter, Carlos Baerga, suddenly two down. Through Wells and back into center field, a base hit for Baerga, and the double play to get Lofton at first is even bigger now. Baerga had a home run on Sunday. He's starting to warm up with the bat. He's always had good luck. Boy, what a difference that double play makes. In a race, the leadoff single is Penny Lofton. Carlos got a little scowl on his face. Thinking back to that call at first. Brady Anderson appears to be fairly comfortable in center field so far here in the early going. He's played left field for the last several years here in Baltimore. There's a guy who's heating up. Albert Bell hit his first two home runs of the season in the Indians' last game on Sunday against the Blue Jays. Could have had three, got under one, and sent it to the warning track. Albert Bell getting hot. Two down by Erga at first here at the top of the first at Camden Yards. Albert Bell is one of the best students of hitting in the American League. He really looks for patterns, studies all of the pitches, keeps a very detailed book of the opposing pitches. He goes to the plate with something on his mind, and he doesn't offer it anything other than that pitch. Look at Alomar playing up the middle. They don't expect Bell to hit anything on the ground to the right side. Not only does he have great instincts, he's a student of the game like Bell. Weak ground ball by Wells. A long run for Alomar. He skips it over to first, not in time. Well, it's not a typical Albert Bell hit, but he'll take it to keep the inning alive. David Wells got off the mound, but couldn't make the play. Alomar feels it barehanded. And remember, it's been raining here for most of the afternoon, and this grass is wet. Watch how he scoops it and throws on the run. Didn't get anything on the throw. Albert Bell knows he's got a chance for a base. It gets out of the box in good shape. Once it's by David Wells, it's up to Alomar, and he can't make the play. Alomar, a winner of five consecutive gold gloves coming into this season. The Indians now with two on and two out. By Ergut second, Bell at first. The Indians with three hits in the inning, but nothing to show for it so far. As designated hitter Eddie Murray gets his first at bat of the night. Struggling in the early going. Eddie Murray course the switch hitter hasn't had too much success against David Wells just two for 12 but those two hits were home runs Wells has the ability to get the ball inside the Murray if he throws that fastball he can pound him on the hand thigh high and above look back to second Wells is low again ball two two and oh Double play for the Orioles. And a couple of hits for the Indians. Two on, two out, and a 2-0 count to Eddie Murray. The appeal, but no. And it's ball three. Uh, take a look at the barrel of that bat. See if Murray kept it back. He got the benefit of the call. That barrel was out in front of the plate. Now David Wells really has to be careful on this pitch. Murray, of course, will get the green light in this situation. And Wells has to make a good pitch. He just can't think about a strike. And Eddie Murray took it for ball four. The Indians have the bases loaded with two down for Julio Franco. Nine, six, the first baseman, number 20. 
David Wells, this is his second start of the season. First time out, he was pretty good. Had just three walks in that ball game against Kansas City. But his mechanics were messed up in the spring. He had a start against the Indians, his second to last spring training start, in which he just left. He threw two innings and was awful. Had bad control, had horrible mechanics, wasn't throwing very hard. And he actually asked to be taken out of the game because he was concerned he was going to hit somebody. That's how wild he was. He is still fighting to find those mechanics that will get him back into the strike zone. It's one of the few changes the Indians made in the offseason. They went to Japan to get Julio Franco to come back and play first base for them. Second time around for Franco with the Indians, replacing Paul Sorrento, who's now gone to Seattle. In Japan, Franco did play mostly first base and hit 306. That's about what he's hit over his major league career. Big situation here. Base is loaded. Two out, top of the first inning. The Indians looking for an early lead against David Wells and the Orioles. Ground ball by Wells to second. Alomar bobbled it a bit, but gets the force at second to get Wells and the Orioles out of trouble. Big double play started by Brady Anderson. The Orioles coming up when we come back. The Indians challenge, but do not score. They leave the bases loaded at the top of the first. We head to the bottom of the first inning here at Camden Yards between two of the real big-time teams in the American League. Here's the Oriole lineup tonight. Brady Anderson moves to center. One of the new acquisitions, Roberto Alomar at second base. Palmero, Bonilla, Ripken, Power in the middle of the order. B.J. Surhoff getting comfortable at third and hitting better than 400 in the early going. Chris Hoyle's behind the plate. Tony Tarasco picked up in a deal. He's played well in right field, and Jeffrey Hammond's getting a chance to play every day in left. Jack McDowell was signed in the offseason as a free agent, and he really gives Mike Hargrove a guy that's going to eat up a lot of innings. His first time out against the Yankees, he lost to his former team, but it was a cold, miserable day in Cleveland. McDowell, a good fastball, will put a lot of pressure on this defense to make plays behind them. Kenny Lofton in center, three consecutive gold gloves for him, and Omar Vizquel, the shortstop, have been outstanding. But it's Kenny Lofton that can really set the tone for a ball game, much like Brady Anderson did for the Orioles in the top half of this inning. Two of the center fielders who can really go get him here in the American League. Lofton doubled off first by Anderson, who leads it off for the Orioles in their half of the inning, and takes strike one from Jack McDowell. Anderson, as Buck mentioned, back into center field after several years as a left fielder but grew up playing center field, so he says he actually still feels more comfortable out in center than he does in left. Ground ball, easy play for Franco, one down. Now Julio Franco won the Japanese equivalent of the gold glove last year at first base. Mike Cargo hoping to get about 130 games for Julio Franco at first base. Of course, they've always got the backup of Eddie Murray over there, so they need to give Julio a day off or two. Now Roberto Alomar, sure to be one of the big stories of the 96 season, off to a good start with the bat for Baltimore. Spent the last five years in Toronto and signed a three-year, $18 million deal to become a member of the Baltimore Orioles. knows Jack McDowell very well. Look at the success he's had. Three home runs, eight runs driven in. And he feels it's just the fact that McDowell's one of those guys that just comes at you. There's a high fastball that rode up out of the strike zone. When you face McDowell, you got to think about a fork ball that breaks in two directions. This good four-seam fastball upstairs, a little extra skip on it, and a great curveball. Just low foot count to Alomar. bounced around over the years in batting orders one two three even six but he's hitting right now in the number two spot behind Anderson in front of Palmero here for the Orioles and ball four sail in high Alomar aboard with Palmero coming up Mike Hargrove is very confident this is a totally different Orioles ball club than he played against last year when his Indians ball club went ten and two 
The addition of Alomar in the middle of this lineup really helps guys like Paul Merrill, Bonilla, and Ripken, three, four, and five. Alomar bluffs a start. He's got his brother there behind the plate. Well, no matter if Roberto steals it or if he gets thrown out by Sandy, this will be the subject of the post-game meal between the two brothers, without a doubt. <laughs> Bragging rights in the house. I got you again. <laughs> no matter who wins. I spoke to Davey Johnson before the game about whether or not he had put the collar on Robbie Alomar in a running situation. He said, hey, I'll take a stolen base any time I can get it. He trusts Alomar's judgment to really give the hitter an opportunity to hit. He compares Robbie Alomar to Barry Larkin, who he had in Cincinnati, as far as being a guy that really understands when to go and when to shut it down. What a jump. And Palmero sends one through the right side into right field. First and third for the Orioles. Alomar's heading home. The relay from Bayer got out at the plate is Roberto Alomar. Bayerga was hollering at Ramirez, hey, give me that ball quicker. Look at Alomar's great jump at first base. Paul Merrill pulls him to the right side of the infield. Now watch the there. He just sails it into second base. Alomar picks up on this and tries to score. Only the alert play by the shortstop, Vizquel, to alert Bayerga led to them throwing him out. Watch him look around. Alomar looks back, says he's going to second. He's got a chance to score. But Vizquel hollers to Bayerga, home, home. And Sandy tags out his brother Robbie at the plate. Each team with a big defensive play here early in this game. Manny Ramirez took his time with the ball in right field against the wrong base runner, but Vizquel and Bayerga combined to throw out Roberto Alomar at the plate. The batter now Bobby Bonilla with a 2-0 count on him. Even after Alomar was tagged out of the plate, he got a big-time ovation from the fans here at Camden Yards who probably aren't used to seeing base running like that as often as they will this season. Well, he doesn't miss too many opportunities to take advantage of defensive lapses. That time, Ramirez just kind of sailed that ball back into second. Alomar turned and just got a peek at that ball going to second base. But Descal, the great player that he is, alerted by Erga that Alomar was headed home and he gunned them down. You mentioned the jump. Alomar obviously had McDowell measured. He was halfway to second base when McDowell started his move to the plate. I'm three and one to Bonilla. Bobby Bonilla has an unusual action to get himself ready. Watch how he holds his foot up, and McDowell makes him wait. Boy, that's very difficult to get the proper timing to go forward. Behind them, three and one. Fouled back now, full camp. As a hitting coach, do you mess with that, or you just look at his career numbers and you say, go get him? Yeah, you can let him uh, work with this as long as he wants to. Rick Downs, the first-year hitting coach, and he has had a lot of success in both leagues. So you just let him work with it. One thing with Bonilla facing McDowell, he is one of the best forkball hitters in all of baseball. He loves that pitch low, even below the knees. 3-2 pitch is low below the knees for ball four. McDowell missed with a fastball. Two on, two out for Cal Ripken. Cal Ripken getting a chance presumably to play in 1996 without nearly as many distractions as he went through in 1995 and off to a good start as you saw seven for 20 so far this season. Like the Indians the Orioles threatening here in their half of the first Ripken will take a strike. Well, as much as Cal said that the streak wasn't a distraction for him last year in August he hit under 200. There were so many things going on. He was so obliging to the media, and everybody wanted a piece of him during that streak. But it had to affect his performance during the game. The 0-1. 
Lipkin reaches out, lifts one to right field. Ramirez is there, and that is it. The Orioles get three runners on, but Roberto Alomar's thrown out at the plate. We're still scoreless. Here in Baltimore, the Indians and Orioles are scoreless through an inning. Both teams came real close to getting some runs across, but couldn't do it. This is the start of what should be a terrific doubleheader here on ESPN tonight. Coming up next, Steve Aver and the, and the Atlanta Braves. Tom Candiotti will start for the Dodgers. Mike Piazza, Mondesi, Carros, all those big bats against Avery. The Braves and Dodgers coming up next on ESPN. Great to see Chipper Jones back already after having some minor surgery, and he came back with a bang, four for four. West Coast hotter than anything these days, too. Four home runs already. Good matchup out on the West Coast. Here's Manny Ramirez to lead off the top of the second for the Indians, almost victimized with a little bit of, I don't know, laziness would be the right word, but just took his time getting the ball back into the infield, got bailed out by his infielders, and that's why we're still in a scoreless game here, but... As Mike Hargrove will tell you, Ramirez's primary function on this team is to swing that bat. Well, one thing they can't do, though, they can't lose their concentration on defense. They might not be blessed with great defensive skills, but at least you've got to pay attention. Bayer got turned and fired a strike to Sandy Alomar to nail Robbie at the plate to cut down the Orioles' second through the inning. Ramirez got going a little bit as the weekend went along for the Indians again they started so slowly but Ramirez hit his first home run of the season on Sunday against the Blue Jays hit 31 last year and still couldn't get out of the eighth spot of the batting order most of the time you know it's probably a pretty good spot for him down in that lineup where pitchers aren't really focused like they would three four and five so he's going to get an awful lot of good pitches down there everybody is very aware that Mike Hargrove has a potent seven eight nine but it's quite a bit different psychologically when a pitcher standing on the mound thinking, well, this is the eighth hitter, and it's not the cleanup hitter. Just missing inside is David Wells, bit of a slump of the shoulders. He wanted it for strike three. Trying to go down and in. You see Hoyle shift to the inside, but that ball looks to be clearly off the inside court. Both count pitch, swung on and missed. Wells has his first strike out of the night. It's a very aggressive ball club, as we all know, and David Wells dropped a change up to Manny Ramirez. Watch how his weight's out on that front foot. Way out in front of it, was expecting to get the heater, and Wells crossed him up. One down in the inning for the catcher, Sandy Alomar. He'll take a strike. Just the main goal for the Indians with respect to Alomar this year, just keeping him in the lineup. Well, he's off to a great start, and they'd love to have him catch 130 games. Injuries have been a problem for him since his rookie year. Had a couple of different knee surgeries. He's put the webbing on his finger. Got a hip problem. But he's healthy this year. Breaking ball, grounded foul, one and two. He's hit three doubles so far, and one thing he's doing that he's really pleased with at the plate is driving the ball to right field. What that does is it gives you a split second longer to judge fastball, breaking ball, changeup. You don't have to be so quick to use the whole field. Whereas when you start to pull the ball, you've got to be really fine and perfect. Here's Wells with the one-two. Fastball, and he gets him. Two up and two down on strikeouts for Wells here in the second. Now that's what he's trying to do with Manny Ramirez at the plate, the previous at bat, but this time he finds the inside corner against Sandy Alomar. Once again, Hoyle slides to the inside, and this time he paints the inside corner and gets Alomar looking, even though the catcher doesn't agree with it. That ball's inside, Larry McCoy. That's what Alomar thought. The batter now, Scott Leyes, hitting ninth and playing third base tonight. Came over from Minnesota in the offseason. The regular third baseman, Jim Telmy, a left-hand hitter, will sit down tonight against the lefty Wells. Telmy has had a struggle against David Wells. He's 0 for 9, and Mike Hargrove believes it's better to sit him off down now and not really 
cause him any more problems. It's something that might linger a few games after this one. Two and one. Play is one of the utility infielders along with Alvaro Espinosa. Fastball high. Three and one. Everybody, of course, wants to be an everyday player, but Scott Leyes comes to a situation that's pretty good for him. He'll get a chance to start against the occasional left-hander, plus the fact that the chances of him playing in the postseason are pretty good, considering he comes from the Minnesota Twins. That's where he spent his last five years. Fly ball hit into left, pretty deep. Back is Hammonds, just in front of the track now, in a couple of steps to make the catch and retire the side. Three up and three down for Wells in the second inning. The Orioles coming up in a scoreless game. Welcome back to Camden Yards in Baltimore. A little late going, but worth it. All kinds of action in the first inning, despite the fact that neither team managed to score. There was a double play for the Orioles. Kenny Lawson got doubled off first, and Roberto Alomar thrown out at the plate. Now in the bottom of the second, another one of the new faces on this Baltimore team, B.J. Serhoff, will lead it off against Jack McDowell. Serhoff, really a versatile player that's beginning to get very comfortable at third base. Played most of his games from Milwaukee behind the plate as the catcher. But he is an offensive player that should benefit from not having to be behind the plate to take all those foul hits and all of the physical wear and tear that you suffer as a catcher. Better than 300 last year, off to a good start this year. 320. That was his career high. 13 home runs, also a career high for Serhoff. McDowell with the 2 1. And Serhoff skies one into foul ground down the left field line over Arleus and Vizquel, but it'll one hop into the seats. Serhoff got a piece of that fork ball. And let me tell you, it looks like Jack McDowell brought his. A game here tonight. He's going hard. He's got a very good fork ball. And although he had a little trouble early on, walked a couple of batters in that first inning, he may be finding the zone now. He gets that fork ball working. He could be more than the Orioles want to contend with here tonight. Here's the 2 2. And Serhoff lines one down the line in right field, but foul. Plenty of distance. But foul. That was the fork ball that Serhoff got to, but he was out in front of it. I tell you, I love McDowell's makeup. You could never really get a read on him on the mound. Take a look at his pitch. It's a fork ball. Serhoff got out in front of it. He's trying to coax it back over that foul pole, but it's way wide of the mark. But McDowell looks to the umpire and says, give me another ball. <laughs> Two two to the leadoff man in the second. That's by the catcher for a full count. Sir Hoff will be followed by Hoyles and Tarasco against Jack McDowell. Boy, he really rounds out this rotation for the Indians pretty nicely. Well, one thing you forget about Jack McDowell is he is the winningest pitcher in the American League in the 90s. He's won 98 ball games. Only Maddox and Glavin of the Braves have won more in the major leagues during the 90s. Full count pitch. Foul. And he's a horse, too. He's going to eat some innings for this team. Average 217 innings over the last five years. There you see the wins in the 90s. A pretty exclusive company. Good battle to lead off this inning between McDowell and B.J. Serhoff. Did he go around? He did. Down to third, and Jim Evans rings up Serhoff, who can't believe it. He goes back to Larry McCoy saying, hey, why don't you call that? Don't ask for help down at third base. He's standing right behind me. Serhoff felt like he checked the swing. It's another fork ball, or he went a long way. Jimmy Evans down at third base rings him up. Alomar puts the tag on him. First strike out of the night for McDowell, and he earned it. 
Now the catcher Chris Hoyles, his first at bat of the night. <laughs> All the moves that the Orioles and their new GM, Pat Gillick, have made, you get the feeling that if there's one more to come, it might be behind the plate. Maybe not necessarily having anything to do with Hoyles, but Pat Gillick has said on a few occasions leading up to this season that he'd like to get another experienced catcher. Greg Zahn is Hoyles' backup right now. One and one, just low. You know, that's a luxury that Davey Johnson doesn't have in this situation is a veteran backup guy. Tony Pena said like Mike Harper. Exactly. Somebody that you can really count on if you want to make a defensive move late the ball game. Somebody's got a strong arm. Charlie O'Brien, guy that the Blue Jays picked up in the offseason. Somebody that come in the game and give you a good defensive catcher. Oyo's well known for his power. But they'd like to have somebody to help him out, give him the odd day off behind the plate. And maybe Allen played the ball game defensively. McDowell ahead of Boyles, a ball and two strikes. Bounces one in, down and away, two and two. With all the moves the Orioles have made, you find it hard to believe they could take on any more payroll. They're right up about $48, $49 million, and Hoyles makes a good chunk of that. Signed that big five-year, $17 million deal. Has this and three more seasons to go on it. One down in the Orioles' second scoreless game, and the 2-2 to Hoyles. Fly ball, left field. Albert Bell on the edge of the track will make the catch. Two down as we send you to Gary Miller at baseball tonight. Dan, update you from Riverfront. Trouble for Burba in the first to give up four to the Mets. Reds came back with a three-run homer from Thomasy. And the Mets are back at it. Rico Bronia hits a rope in the center field. Everett has just knocked in Lance Johnson. This one will bring home Gilkey. It is six to three as the Reds have given up on the seconds. Top of the third there. Back to you. Well, the Mets have had some problems with their young pitching staff, but the hitters are coming around all right. Gilkey, what a pickup he was, a veteran in the outfield. But with young pitchers, sometimes you're gonna have to ride the roller coaster a bit for them. There's yet another pickup for the Orioles. Tony Tarasco out of right field. In fact, he didn't get it to strike one. Tarasco picked up in a deal from the Montreal Expos for Sherman Abando. A trade that was actually made by the Orioles' assistant GM, Kevin Malone, who last year was the GM of the Expos. And Tarasco there liked him and brought him here to Baltimore. Is that insider trading? <laughs> Boy, what a pickup. 25-year-old Tony Carrasco. You can see he had a decent year last year with the Expos. 14 homers, 40 RBIs. He comes out of the Atlanta Braves organization. But there was some concern in Montreal that they may lose Moise Salou, a right-handed hitter. And they went after a right-handed bat in Sherman Obanda. Ground ball down to first. It'll stay fair for Franco, who will do it himself. And like Wells in his half of the inning, McDowell goes three up and three down. Kenny Lofton will lead it off when we come back. Top of the third to Baltimore. Scoreless between the Indians and the Orioles here at Camden Yards. You saw the Mets leading tonight. Sunday night baseball. You'll get another look at the Mets. Rico Bronia, the exciting young shortstop, Ray Ordonez. They'll be out in Denver at Coors Field to take on the slugging. Colorado Rockies, Bichette, Castilla, Yalaraga, Walker and company against the Mets Sunday night. Now, in Sunday night's game, you'll get to see one of the best young pitching prospects in all of baseball for the Mets, Jason Isringhausen. Also right-hander, do a lot of things for that Mets team. Cool night here at Camden Yards as Kenny Lofton will lead off the top of the third for the Indians. Second time through the order for left-hander David Wells. Lofton dumped a base hit into left field to lead off the game. But moments later was doubled up at first. On a great play out in the center by Brady Anderson. That's an interesting pitch right there to Lofton. That's the same pitch he singled on in the first inning, but David Wells came right back to it. It's a pretty good idea, too, because the hitter wouldn't expect him to come right back with the curveball. Fastball, and Lofton is two for two.
Well, once again, we've got that Kenny Lofton, David Wells confrontation. And Wells really had Lofton confused at first base, getting some instruction from Davy Nelson, who's a pretty good base dealer himself. Lofton should be pretty familiar with Wells. Aside from his stint in Cincinnati, Wells has been in the American League. As Vizquel steps in, lined out to center, first time up. Lofton again, just leaning slightly back to first as Wells delivers to the plate. Kenny Lofton's just going to have to guess with David Wells if he wants to steal a bag right here. Go ahead and go on his first move. He hasn't been able to get a real good read on Wells at all. Sometimes as a base dealer, you look right at the pitcher and you can't see anything. Even when he's coming at the base, you're kind of in a fog. On Sunday, Kenny Lofton became the Indians' all-time leader in stolen bases. David Wells has shown him every single move in his book. That time, he stepped off the rubber and gave him that sidearm toss. trying to hit it to right field, hit it over the first base dugout, swing to into seats. Should have to get some new lumber. Try to hit that one off the end of the bat. He was trying to shoot this ball in the right field. He reaches for it, well out of the strike zone, right off the end of the bat. I have to go find some new wood. I guess he doesn't get the prime bat location. Guys like Alfred Bell just leave theirs up where they need them. Vizquel's got to get all the way back inside. Had quite the year last year, defensively you expect, but quite the offensive season too. And I guess it helps to have some of the guys around him like he had in the Indians lineup. Well, you know, you have a tendency to look at this gal and say, okay, well, boy, this is a break in this powerful lineup. And pitchers will challenge him and he'll make things happen. Often not going in the 1-1 into the air. Shallow center field. Back from second is Roberto Alomar to make the play. And Lofton this time will get safely back to first. Second baseman, A lot of the Orioles players in talking about Alomar. Impressed, they obviously know about his athletic ability, but impressed now as a teammate, his instincts, his intelligence about the game, his desire to play the game. And he says he feels like a kid again, playing with the young fellow over at shortstop. Well, he loves the way Cal Ripken goes about his job. Always looking for an edge, always looking for a pattern that a hitter will show against them. Bobby Alomar, of course, has been around the game his whole life. His father, Sandy Alomar, was a great second baseman, played for the Angels, played for the Yankees. Bobby's father told me that as young as five years old, he began to ask, hey, Dad, how come you did that? So he always had an interest in the subtle aspects of the game. Loft in the lead, Carlos Baerga, the batter. Kenny Lofton still trying to get a read on David Wells. Took a step, didn't like it, shut it down. Didn't like his jump at all. The game within the game here between David Wells and Kenny Lofton with one on, one out. The top of the third, Indians and Orioles are scoreless. There he goes. Orioles the throw down, the tag by Alomar, but Lofton is now six for six on the young season. Kenny Lofton didn't get a great jump at first base. He simply outran that ball. Alomar's tag was late. Hoyles did everything he could. He doesn't have a real strong arm, but he unloaded it quickly, threw it on to money. Watch the break. Not a great break. David Wells with the slide step. Tough pitch for Hoyles down. One thing you don't want to do is rush your throw and throw it into center. 
you'll concede second base, but you don't want to give him third. Not many guys for uh, Kenny Lofton. And this game may not be over yet with Lofton at second, except by Erga lines one down into the corner in left field. This will get Lofton home easily. Extra bases for Carlos Baerga. His double has given the Indians a one to nothing lead. Well, Lofton serves as a distraction. Comes across and scores the first run of the ball game. Baerga hit a pretty good pitch. Watch this fastball. Down and in, and he was all over it keeps it fair down the left field line jeffrey hammond gets it back in boston scores easily and the indians jump out in front on by second double of the season guys just starting to heat up scored eight runs on sunday four home runs here's albert bell he goes after the first pitch sirhoff down at third the long throw across the infield to get him as by has to hold it second Orioles are really pleased with the way B.J. Serhoff has gone about his business learning third base all over again. This is not an easy play. He has to go to his right. Ball skips off this wet grass. Takes a look at Bayerga. Chases him back to second base and goes across the infield for the out. Amy Johnson knows a little bit about defense. Former Gold Glove winner here for the Orioles. Two down in the inning now. Bayerga still out at second after the RBI double. And the batter is the DH, Eddie Murray. Indians leading one to nothing. Down and in. Murray would like to get on track. His pursuit last year was a little less publicized than Cal Ripken's consecutive game streak. But Eddie Murray last year hit the 3,000 hit mark. These two former teammates with so much respect for one another, Ripken and Murray. Well, Cal Ripken tells you, Eddie Murray's the guy that really showed him how to play the game, how to be prepared every single day. Well, it's a long look at Bayerga. 2-0 to Murray. Look where Eddie Murray ranks among the all-time greats in the game. Now 20 in virtually every offensive category, and those 479 home runs are significant. Murray 21 away from becoming only the third player in history to have 500 home runs and 3,000 hits. And you want to talk about your exclusive company. <laughs> those other two guys aren't too bad, are they? Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. What a career Eddie Murray has had. And you know, Eddie doesn't talk to the media. And a lot of people don't really consider him to be a great guy. But every teammate you talk to, when they talk about Eddie Murray, including Cal Ripken, talk about this guy as being a great teammate. Cal Ripken says Eddie Murray showed him when he first got to big leagues that there was a particular way to prepare yourself, think about who you were playing against, and how to go about your business. 2-1 to Murray. Skied into the air left side. Ripken with a chance to retire his former teammate, and he does. The Indians, though, get a run on the Bayerga double. To the bottom of the third we go. one nothing try. Certainly a different Juan Guzman than people saw in 94 and 95. Will the real Juan Guzman please stand up? Well, he was 40-11 and 11 when he first came into the league, and they're hopeful that he is back headed towards that direction again. Here's Jeffrey Hammonds leading off the bottom of the third for the Orioles against Jack McDowell. Hammonds, much like Sandy Alomar for the Indians, just trying to stay healthy, get through a season, see if he can reach this promise. And he's down here. He pops one up on the infield. Leyes in near the mound to make the play one down. Well, Scott Leyes had Jack McDowell standing right next to him to help him out. That ball was popped up on the infield, and McDowell was holler and lay us all the way top of the order again with one down for Brady Anderson Anderson tapped 
stepped out to first to lead off the game for the Orioles. The Orioles' best chance to score came in the first. Roberto Alomar thrown out at the plate. The Orioles left two aboard. Softly to left center field. This is trouble and it drops. Lofton hustling in and he'll hold Anderson to a single. Herberto Alomar will be coming up and he was right in the middle of things in the first inning. Watch this. Well, he breaks from first base and Palmero singles for right field. Manny Ramirez nonchalants the ball back to the infield and when Alomar picks up on it, he breaks for home. But the infield of the Indians is alert, and they gun down Robbie Alomar. You might question his judgment first inning of a ball game with Bonilla coming up, but Alomar will do that just to try and force the issue. That time he was gunned down on a good play by, by Erga. Anderson the lead. Alomar will take ball one. We mentioned Alomar's success against McDowell. He walked against him in the first inning. He's 16 for 29 against McDowell. Including three home runs. There goes Anderson. And he's in there. Stolen base for Brady Anderson, his second of the season. Sandy Alomar with a very strong arm, but Anderson got a good jump off Jack McDowell. Take a look at the jump at first base. His first move, Anderson, straight steal all the way. Robbie Alomar takes the pitch. Not even close at second. Anderson creeping up on Al Bunbury atop the Baltimore Oriole all-time stolen base list. Big swing by Alomar, two and one. and appreciates yet another benefit of having Alomar on this team. A number two hitter who's patient, knows how to use the bat. They'll give Brady a chance to steal some more bases. He had a high of 53 back in 1992. 2-1 count. Now three balls in a strike. Alomar is a very good situation as a hitter. He's got the count in his favor. You saw it 2 0, where he had a big swing. 3 0, look for the same type of swing. He'll take it for ball four. McDowell's third walk of the game already. Two on now for the dangerous Rafael Palmero. Romero pulled one through the right side in his first at bat. Back in the first inning, that was the play on which Alomar got thrown out of the plate. And you can see all kinds of speed on the bases for the Orioles. And Anderson and Alomar. This Indians lineup is tough, but things don't get any easier for Jack McDowell here facing the Orioles. Well, for so many years, the Orioles had a saying, well, we'll work wait for the three-run homer going all the way back to Earl Weaver days but even with this potent lineup and guys like Palmero, Bonilla and Ripken maybe Johnson will let Anderson and Alomar run a bit. McDowell throws a lot of fork balls has a good curveball that can be tough for the catcher. Fastball up and in one and one. Javier Palmero has really come into his own as a hitter. This list, the leaders in hits in the 90s, topped by Tony Gwynn and Kirby Puckett. The 1-1. One, one. And Palmero will take it right down the middle for strike two. McDowell went upstairs with a fastball. It looked like Palmero was expecting something off speed. So now... 
key point in the ball game early. Alomar, McDowell, Frankel all discussing this next pitch. You would expect McDowell to come with a fork ball here. One and two count. He's got a couple of pitches to work with. Anderson at second. Alomar at first. Ahead of Palmero, a ball and two strikes. Fastball, and he gets them. Two down. Well, a very timely meeting between the pitcher and catcher. They went out to talk over the situation with a tough out in Rafael Palmero, and they go right back to the fastball. That riding fastball up and away from Palmero, and he swings right through it. There wasn't an awful lot of heart in that swing as it appeared as though he may have had the forkball in the back of his mind. Indians aren't out of the woods yet, though. Barrow, a strikeout victim, two down, but another tough hitter now in Bobby Bonilla. Jack McDowell is throwing harder as the evening moves along. His fastball was about 86, 87 in the first inning, topping out at about 90 here in the third. Well, he's right up to 49 pitches already. He's starting to get loose a little bit. Hey, you stay upstairs on Bonilla, you can have some success with him. He's a very good low ball hitter. And given the fastball McDowell has right now, that might be a pretty good game for him. That one instead, it's a ball and a strike. The DH, at least for the meantime, is Bobby Bonilla with Carrasco out in right field. BJ Serhant doing a great job at third base. Bobby Carrasco, the young right fielder for the time being. Davey Johnson wants to do this with Bonilla. He told Bobby, he said, listen, I know you can play in the outfield. I know you can play third base, but I've got two young outfielders in Carrasco and Hammonds. I want them to get comfortable in the outfield. That doesn't mean you're going to be the DH for the whole season. Carrasco's off to a good start with the bat. But right now, he says, we're using a roving DH. It's not roving much right now. One, two, again. Close pitch. McDowell. Now the 2 2 count on Benny. A big situation here. A couple of Orioles aboard with two down in the third. Brady Anderson out at third. Single, stole second. Roberto Alomar drew the walk for the second time in this game. 1 0 Cleveland. McDowell sets. And the 2 2 breaking ball stays high. A full count. Behind Bonilla, more trouble lurking. Should it get that far? Cal Ripken. Full count pitch. Ground ball right side. Franco to McDowell, and they'll get him. And finish off the Orioles, who leave two more aboard. Through three, the Indians lead the Orioles one to nothing. Mets and Reds from Riverfront. Paul Wilson, the bearded one, the rookie for the Mets, trying to hold on to a big lead. But Eric Owens goes the other way on him with two aboard. Three two-out hits for the Reds in their half of the third. That scored Willie Green and Mike Kelly. Guilty has come back with a run-scoring double and a wild one at 7-5 to five Mets. Back to Dan and Buck. Now Paul Wilson laboring tonight, Gary. Sunday night, a chance to see another one of those great young arms the Mets have. Jason Isringhausen, but he'll have his work cut out for him, taking on Dante Bichette. He of the 40 home runs last year. John Miller, Joe Morgan will be with you from Coors Field in Denver for Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN. Got a good one going here in Baltimore. Top of the fourth inning, the Indians leading the Orioles one to nothing. David Wells for Baltimore, Jack McDowell for Cleveland. The only run of the game coming in on a Carlos Baerga RBI double in the third inning. Right down the middle, one and one. How do you view the Paul Sorrento for Julio Franco exchange? The Indians have made it first. Well, I think what they wanted was another right-handed bat. They went out and got Franco. He had a two-week window 
It is Japanese ball club to negotiate a contract back in the States. And he struck a deal with Cleveland. Former American League batting champ. And, you know, the jury's still out on him, of course, in first base, whether or not he's able to handle that on an everyday basis. But he had a great year in Japan. And the Indians were looking around to shore up their lineup a bit as if they really needed to, but <laughs> when you had a shot at Franco, they went right after him. Was he telling you that there are another dozen Hideo Nomos over there who could come and pitch that effectively in the majors? He said 12 to 16, wow. as good as Nomos. Hmm. See a bit of a wake-up call to North America, I think, to see that happen. Yeah, they don't want to have any real good trade agreements right now with Japan <laughs> to bring more pitchers over here. 2-2, two, two, in on his hands, and he fights it off. You know, when Julio Franco first came up to the Indians, Mike Harper was telling me that he'd go over to him and say, listen, Julio, I know this stance is okay when you're young, but boy, when you get older, you're going to have to change. You're not changing yet. He wraps that bat way around his helmet, and he still gets to the ball. And maybe more than any right-hand hitter in the game has right center field as his power. He's got great coverage out over the plate. If you can get the ball to the inside corner and really pound him with a good fastball, you can have some luck with him. But he'll set you up there, too. This one, you think that's a good spot to go. He'll turn on one. David Wells doesn't have real good command. He's all over the place. There's a couple of guys with pretty good command right there. Jack McDowell and Oral Hirschheisen. Both of them opened up in the cold confines, and not to mention El Presidente, Dennis Martinez, who beat the Blue Jays on Sunday. Still having some fun. Boy, why not? Look at all the bats that are on that bench. Martinez now into his 40s. Hoping to lead this team back to the World Series. Got up to such a great start last year. Trouble staying healthy in the second half of the season. Had knee surgery in the offseason. He says he feels great. Had a little bit of a rocky start on Sunday and a great defensive play by Kenny Lofton. Turned an extra base bid by Joe Carter into a double play. Ground ball to Roberto Alomar. Franco is gone, one down in the Cleveland fourth. Here at Camden Yards, two of the real big-time teams in the American League, the Indians and the Orioles. Cleveland leading 1-0. Cool night. Had some rain a little bit earlier. This game started about 15 minutes behind schedule. Jack McDowell for the Indians. David Wells for the Orioles. Carlos Baerga's RBI double in the third inning and giving Cleveland the 1-0 lead they now enjoy. It's 2-3 on the young season. The Orioles at 5-1. Starting off in very impressive fashion. Well, I'll tell you, back in Cleveland, on the weekend when the Indians were 0-3, there was panic in the streets. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was, for three games out of 162-game season, it was unbelievable how upset and worried a lot of the fans were. What's wrong with this club? The Yankees beat him twice. The Blue Jays beat him the first game of the three-game series. And people were panicking. Mike Hargrove was away from the ball club to visit his father down in Texas. So when he came back on Saturday, he had noticed that the Indians wore ski masks during the game on Friday night. Carlos Baerga came into his office and said, hey, Skip, can we wear these blue jerseys because we're all in through, all in free? Hargrove said, sure, wear the blue jerseys, but take off those stupid ski hats. <laughs> <laughs> they were preoccupied by the cold weather. Wells in on the hands of Ramirez. There was a play in one of the games between the Indians and the Blue Jays. Omar Vizquel was wearing the full ski mask, only a space for his eyes, and there was a pop-up on the infield. Vizquel pulled down the mask over his face, said, I got it, and put the mask back up over his face so he wouldn't be too cold, and caught it with just enough space for his eyes to stick out. Well, struck out Ramirez in the second, ahead of him one and two here in the fourth. Now time. Cold weather gripping much of the country here in the early going. Snow again in 
Massachusetts the Red Sox snowed out for the second time the Indians have had three of their games postponed the Yankees had a lot of trouble getting some games in Wells to Ramirez with a 2-2 count Another ground ball to the right side on a broken bat. Roberto Alomar's second play of the inning, two down. A lot of hockey action coming up. Battle of the East, the Devils, the Stanley Cup champs, fighting for their playoff lives. They'll take on the Capitals tomorrow night, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN, and then a great battle out of the West on Friday night. The Blackhawks and the Red Wings, Detroit, coming into action tonight, just one win away from matching the all-time NHL record of 60 wins in a season set by the Montreal Canadiens back in 1976-77. Down to the wire in the NHL, scrapping for playoff position. It's getting underway here in Major League Baseball this season. Week and a half into the 96 regular season. Sandy Alomar, a strikeout victim against Wells, his first at bat. And another ground ball to the right side. It's time to play for Palmero. Underhands to Wells. Three up and three down for Wells, who set down five in a row. Cal Ripken to lead it off for the Orioles when we come back to Camden Yards. Numbers Jack McDowell seems to be having a pretty good night. Two hits and he shut out the Orioles through three. But between innings, he didn't seem completely happy, Buck, with the way that things have been going so far for him. Well, he was talking with Mark Wiley, the pitching coach of the Cleveland Indians, about the grip on his fork ball. He felt like he was cutting under the ball and not really getting on top of it. So Wiley and McDowell trying to learn each other. And Wiley, of course, wants to be able to help Jack McDowell iron out any problems whenever they pop up. We see Mark Wiley in his second skin as the Indians pitching coach. McDowell here in the fourth faces Cal Ripken to lead it off. This is for ball one. Fly ball to right field. First time up for Ripken. That ended the first inning and ended the threat for the Orioles. They left two on. McDowell takes that fourth ball the extra mile because he has the ability to break it down and in and down and away to hitters. Dave Stewart can do the same thing with it and it can be a problem for catching until you really get to know when McDowell likes to use those different pitches. You don't have a different set of signs for it but McDowell will use finger pressure and grip angle on the ball to get us a break down and away or down and in. <laughs> Ball by the mound. Slow roller out to Bayerga. Ripkins out by a couple of steps. Let's check in with Gary Miller. One nothing game was well for the Blue Jays, but a tough spot for Juan Guzman, who's got the lead. J.C. Snow with a bullet. But right to a leaping Alex Gonzalez. Doubles his man off with Domingo Cedeno. Nine strikeouts and six for Guzman as his team bats. Bottom six. Back to you. All right, Gary. Blue Jays off to a four and two start and leading again tonight. Here's B.J. Surha. He'll take a strike. Surha last year played about everywhere except third base. Caught first base, right, left, D.H. 94 played a lot of third base, but has his best chance yet to play on a on a winner here in Baltimore after the last few years of Milwaukee Brewers struggling. Two. Well, McDowell and Alomar really play with Sir Hobbs' mind. The first at bat, DJ saw a lot of fork balls, and this time two fastballs to the outside corner. And Sir Hobbs can't pull the trigger. That's the whole essence of pitching, in my mind, is never establishing a pattern that the hitter can pick up on particularly good hitters. And I consider BJ Sir Hobbs a good hitter, a guy that's got good plate coverage. He doesn't have to look for one side of the plate to be successful. McDowell gets him, came back inside with the fastball, and Surhoff is gone. He struck out twice tonight. 
Now Serhoff talking to himself as he goes back to the dugout. This time they use the fastball. First to the outside part of the plate to set up that inside strike. Serhoff is really in between now. Good pitch right on the inside corner, and Serhoff has struck out twice tonight. Two down for McDowell here in the fourth. The batter, Chris Hoyles. First pitch swinging is Hoyles. Weak grounder. It's just foul. Leyes let that one roll for a bit. Third base up. Jim Evans and Larry McCoy behind the plate collaborating on the call. Well, for a moment, that didn't look like that ball was going to go into fair territory. Scott Leyes comes into foul ground, and just before it got to the bag, it looked like it was inches in the foul territory. He didn't have much of a choice right then because it didn't appear as though he was going to have a play even though it was the catcher Hoyles running. Leyes was so deep at third base that swinging bunt went all the way down to the bag before Leyes could make a play on it. Well, you see how deep he is at third. The 0-1 from McDowell. This collaboration between McDowell and Alomar or any pitcher and catcher probably should be taken for granted considering turnover year to year. Every catcher's got three or four new pitchers to deal with. And you've got five, six weeks to get to know. Them. And it takes a while to realize what a pitcher can do or what he's most comfortable with. That's the key. You know, everybody can call a game when a pitcher's got all of his pitches working. That's no problem. You just throw down a few of these, a few of those, and you work your way through it. But the real good batteries are the ones that can figure out where to go when a pitcher doesn't have his good stuff. And that will take Sandy Alomar a while to figure out what works best for Jack McDowell. Hoyles cranks one to left field. No play for Albert Bell. This game is tied. Chris Hoyles with his first home run of the season. Got a fastball from Jack McDowell and hammered it into the seats in left field. Alomar tries to slide inside. It's not a bad pitch, but they didn't get it in far enough. Oil's nose is gone, even in this cold, damp air at Camden Yards tonight. He's been using the fastball in this inning, and that time Chris Hoyles got to one. Orioles on the board. Tony Tarasco, the batter. RBI number two for Hoyles in a 1-1 game at the bottom of the fourth. The Indians now out hitting the Orioles 5-3. to three. This Indians line up. We see on the other side of the field the best in baseball, but the bottom third of Hoyles, Tarasco, and Hammonds is nothing to overlook either. Well, it's good when you can put a couple of everyday players in your lineup and not really have to hit them high in the order in reference to Tarasco and Hammonds. Don't get the feet wet. Don't get comfortable down in that bottom part of the order where they don't really get a lot of attention from the opposing pitcher. Another good sports ball there. That's John Stearns, the first base coach in his first season with the Orioles. Davey Johnson bringing in just about an entire new coaching staff. Here in 96, San Colazo down at third base 
Carrasco swings over the top of it, and he's gone. McDowell bounces back to strike him out, but the Chris Hoyles bullet, 423 feet, has tied the game. Yards, one to one on the home run by Chris Hoyles. It tied the game. No doubt about that one. It was a fastball. McDowell says, my fault, Sandy Alomar. He didn't get it in enough, and Hoyles made him pay. Ties the game at one here at the top of the fifth inning. The number nine hitter, third baseman Scott Leyes to face left-hander David Wells. Indians have sure had their chances against Wells tonight. Leyes just his third at bat of the season, getting some playing time in the place of Jim Tomey tonight. Leyes moving from the team with the worst record in the major leagues to the team with the best record in the major leagues. Tomey getting a night off against the left-hander. Inside out, squibber down to first. Palmero, one down. We talk so much about Ripken and Alomar defensively that we fail to mention the first baseman's not too shabby either. Rafael Palmero led the American League in fielding last year. He's got great range. So I tell you, they have got some good fielders in that inner defense. If you're a pitcher on this staff and you throw any fly balls, you need to check with the coaches again. Take time out and look around the infield. There are some great fielders behind you. Top of the order now for Kenny Lofton. Lofton hasn't had a whole lot of trouble with David Wells so far in this game. First time up, base hit left field. Second time up, base hit center field. Stolen base, as you can see. DJ Serhoff way in front of the dirt at third base. Lofton still thinking about a punt. How tough is that play? For Surhoff getting reacquainted with the position and instead of being, say, 100 feet away from Lofton, he's about 60 feet away from Lofton. <laughs> but you really got to have some nerve to come in that close because Kenny Lofton can slap the ball and drive it by you. And you got to get in there and take the run away, but you still got to be quick with those hands. Two and one. But takes strike two and has some thoughts for Larry McCoy on the call. Well, they wanted to check with McCoy to see if he was calling the bunt attempt or a called strike. Watch how quickly he turns back to the umpire. He took the bat back. McCoy said that's a good pitch, and Lofton said, oh, I don't know. Now the 2-2 two -two from Wells. Fastball outside for ball three. afraid to voice its opinion. Young players but full of confidence to say the least up and down this Indians line. Don't forget this is just the first half of a terrific baseball doubleheader tonight. Coming up next Steve Avery in the Atlanta Braves. Head to Chavez Ravine to take on the Dodgers. Tom Candiani will get the start for the Dodgers. Two of the real favorites in the National League. Braves and the Dodgers in the West. Coming up following our game tonight on a Wednesday Night Baseball here on ESPN. 3-2 to Lofton. He reaches out, chops it to the right side. Alomar with time to get him two down. Well, they get Kenny Lofton for the first time tonight. Robbie Alomar takes that easy ground ball off the run and fires the first. Seven straight now retired by David Wells. Five of those on ground ball. That's five in a row. Set down on ground balls by David Wells. And in this ballpark against this team, it's a good idea. That ball on the ground. Let the infield try to gobble it up. As Omar Vizquel steps up, takes a big breaking curveball for strike one. really settled down since the third inning of this game seven in a row set down and this could be eight Brady Anderson tracking back plenty of room and he's got it three up and three down again eight in a row set down by Wells 
It is 1-1 through four and a half. Two outstanding hitting teams, the Indians and the Orioles, but a couple of pretty good pitchers on the mound as well. Jack McDowell and David Wells, and they've both been doing the job. Just 1-1 one, one through four and a half. Coyles, a bullet to left, well into the seats. His first home run of the season, Carlos Vallardo, responsible for the Cleveland offense so far tonight. McDowell to face Jeffrey Hammond, Brady Anderson, and Roberto Alomar here in the fifth. Buck mentioned with a couple of young outfielders in the corners. Tony Tarasco at right, Jeffrey Hammonds at left. Sneaking in at third, Scott Lage. Baltimore's got a pretty good fallback position in Mike Devereaux. As Hammonds lifts a fly ball, right field overcomes Ramirez near the line to make the catch. Well, they'd like to be able to give Jeffrey Hammond some everyday time so he can really get comfortable in the big leagues. He's been hampered by a series of injuries, and Davey Johnson knows that he's got a talented young player, but he needs to get some regular at-bats and gain some confidence both at the plate and in the field. Brady Anderson, center fielder this year, one for two so far tonight. Down low for ball one is McDowell. You know, McDowell has pitched a good game. He doesn't seem very happy with the way things are going. Well, when you get guys like Jack McDowell and David Code and Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin, they are so good at what they do that when they make a mistake, they're tough on themselves. They're very good preparing themselves for starts. They know strengths and weaknesses of the lineup they're facing. When they don't execute, they're not very pleased. The thing about McDowell that I like I've seen tonight is the velocity on his fastball. It seems as though he's really got the life back in his fastball, both the sinker and the four-seam. It's just one to left field. Albert Bell back toward the corner. He's got plenty of room out there. Stumbles under it a bit, but makes the catch. Two down as we send you to Gary Miller. Gary? Little of everything at Riverfront. Paul Wilson not a good outing in his second Major League start. Ed Poventry has terrorized him. Hit a three-run homer earlier. This time he will double in a run, and then Hal Morris will knock him in after Larkin scores. Wilson, three and two-thirds, seven earns, six walks. Back to you. Now well, that's what you concern yourself with when you're working with a young pitcher that he might lose some confidence being roughed up early. And let's hope that's not the case with Paul Wilson. High hopes for the young pitching staff in New York and high hopes for the or Orioles in general here in Baltimore with their acquisitions. One of them at the plate right now, Roberto Alomar taking high one and one. Orioles and Pat Gillick initially went after Craig Biggio in the offseason. He re-signed with Houston, and then Alomar came in. The Yankees were also in hot pursuit of Alomar. It seemed like it almost came down to of David Cohn and Roberto Alomar. Baltimore would get one. The Yankees would get the other. Neither team presumably had enough money to pay both. They both make about $6 million a season. Well, the Yankees would love to have Alomar now, considering their problems at second base. Lost from Andis, who was going to move over from shortstop and play. He broke his elbow, and Pat Kelly's got shoulder problems, so Mariano Duncan is the second baseman right now. So we're going to miss two and two. And Peter Andros, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, who hired a couple of general managers. Pat Gillick, the general manager. Kevin Malone, the assistant general manager. Many new players, coaches, managers. Lots of changes here in Baltimore, and they expect big things from this team. This is not a let's build gradually toward a championship five or six years down the road. This is let's get it done, guys. Two down in the inning, a full count to Roberto Alomar. McDowell misses high ball four, and Alomar draws his third walk of the night. Not too pleased with himself. That's what we mentioned about McDowell earlier. He was trying to paint that outside corner to Alomar. Remember, Alomar has really 
Quite a tough hitter for McDowell, and right here he tries to go outside and walks Robbie for the third time tonight. get a consensus about how the weather affects ball games, whether it gives an edge to the pitcher or whether it gives an edge to the hitters. McDowell struggling with his with his release point, with his grip a little bit on the full like this. It seems as though he's bothered a bit by it. He's walked four, scored 84 pitches, but you can see he's been effective, just three hits. Now one of those guys that goes out there and throws and doesn't really worry too much about anything other than the outcome. That's why sometimes ERA might be inflated. He's got one thing on his mind, and that's getting a W. As a teammate, you'd love to have pitches like that who keep coming at the opposition. Another check on Alomar with Rafael Palmero with the plate right now. Base hit to right field for Palmero. Shot it between first and second. In the first inning, Bayerga was a lot closer to the bag at second. He's moved a good 15, 20 feet to his left now here later in the game. A different situation with two outs here, so they're not concerned about a possible double play, so they're trying to take the hole away from Palmero. Palmero then obviously knows on any kind of a steal attempt, if there is one from Alomar, that it would be the shortstop to scale taking the throw. Breaking ball drops in for a strike, one and one. Now we haven't seen too many curveballs from McDowell, but he throws a dandy here to Palmero who freezes. So think about McDowell. He's got two fastballs, a couple of different fork balls, and then that great hook to always bail himself out. The one one. Fastball, broken back down to first. Franco with time to retire Palmero and the Orioles in the fifth. The Orioles leave a runner aboard. Bayerga, Bell, and Murray do up for the Indians in the sixth. Powerful lineups with just two runs to show for it. One aside, Jack McDowell, David Wells, two pickups. His pitchers have done a great job tonight. Carlos Bayerga, the only guy really to solve David Wells tonight. Well, and David Wells had a pretty good pitch. It might have been a ball down and in. Bayerga does a good job keeping it fair down into the left field corner. That chases home Kenny Lawson, who hit single to center. And David Wells and Jack McDowell have hooked up and neutralized two pretty good offensive ball clubs. These two teams are as good an example as any in baseball. How the gap between the haves and the have-nots is just getting wider and wider. You look at all the big free agents. McDowell comes to a contender. David Cohn to the Yankees. Alomar to the Orioles. Even most of the big trades that are made, like the David Wells being acquired, the haves are, are lapping the have-nots right now. If you look at the salaries, you got a bunch of teams up around 40, 45, even 50 million, and a whole lot around 18 or 20. There aren't too many in the middle. Now, that's why the owners are saying they need revenue sharing to kind of spread the wealth a little more evenly. Ball players will tell you it doesn't really make an awful lot of difference. Ken Merker comes here from the Atlanta Braves, and of course, we all know the success the Braves have had the last couple of years. But Merker, a very good starting pitcher. Bayerga fights off the 0-2. Surhoff, the long throw, and he gets him one down in the six. Coming up Sunday afternoon on ESPN, the first Union 400, the seventh rate of the NASCAR season, coming to you from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. The defending champ is Dale Earnhardt, but he trails Dale Jarrett in the Winston Cup standings, 933 to 896. Bob Jenkins, Benny Parsons, and Ned Jarrett have the call for you Sunday from North Carolina. Back here at sold out Camden Yards, better than 45,000 on a cold April night to watch the Indians and the Orioles. These two teams rained out last night as Albert Bell spanks one. A long way to right center field and gone. Two one Indians.
50 home runs in 1995, and Albert Bell gets a fastball away and drives it to center field. He knows he got plenty of it. He's already into his home run slot. So Albert Bell is starting to heat up for the Cleveland Indians, even on a cool night in Camden Yard. Third home run of the season for Bell, and third in the Indians' last two games. Solo shots. This one gives the Indians a two-to-one lead here in the sixth inning. The batter Eddie Murray, big cut, one and one. Murray struggling so far this season, just two for 18. Both of his hits though have come from the right side, and the Baltimore folks have forgotten Eddie Murray in the years he put in here. One more look at Albert Bell's third home run of the season. He is so strong out over the plate. David Wells got that fastball up and away from Albert Bell. And you could say it was up a bit. Murray pops one up right side. Out of play. He's got to toughen you up a little bit as an opposing pitcher when the big guys come up. And Albert Bell puts up some numbers like these on you. No time to let down because you got a future Hall of Famer coming up next, and then a batting champion, and then a 30 home run guy. And it just keeps going and going on this team. It's generally, when you have the best offensive production, is when there's a bunch of guys in the lineup having good years. Think about the Giants when they had Thompson and Barnes and Williams all in the lineup at the same time, and then the Braves. And the Riff and Wesco and a lot of guys around those good hitters like Albert Bell. Always putting the pressure on the pitcher. Pitchers always feel like, well, if you make a mistake, you're going to get killed. No soft spots in this Indians lineup, that's for sure. Ground ball left side. Two hopper to Surhoff. A couple of pumps, and then he fires it across. Two down. Let's send it to Gary Miller. Stan, the Angels are your only American League team to get shit out this season. Pat Penkin did it in the opener of the series in Toronto. But down one nothing, Mike Aldretti hits just the 36th home run of his serpentine career. Off Guzman, it tied the game at one. They've gone to the bottom of the eighth. One all. Back to you. Mike Aldretti off the bench with a home run for the Angels. Here, two to one Indians leading the Orioles. Sixth inning at Camden Yards. Got a home run here in this ballpark. Albert Bell to right center field. Created quite a buzz in the ballpark as he launched one for his third of the season, giving the Indians a 2-1 lead. You know, a lot of attention is made to whether this is the year that Roger Maris's record falls, 61 homers, but maybe a little more realistic, and Bell certainly is a major, not the major threat to do that. But how do the Indians as a team challenging the mark of the 61 game? He's 240 home runs. Another team that you have to consider as challengers to that team record would be the Boston Red Sox with the addition of Kevin Mitchell to go along with Bo Vaughn and Jose Canseco, Mike Stanley. And there are some teams in the American League that can throw some lumber at you. Top to bottom of the Indians lineup. The Orioles no slouches. The Red Sox. They're going to drop a few baseballs out there. We know that. But they're going to lose a few over the outfield wall as well. Hopefully none off the top of Jose Canseco's head. That play that was immortalized a few years ago when he went back and popped off the top of his head. They might lose a few home runs. The Indians in the Sorrento-Franco exchange. They'll pick up some batting average. Of course, Sorrento had a, a night and a half in Seattle. A couple of nights ago, two homers, six driven in. Well, he's a guy that's anxious to get everyday playing time, too. You know, in a team situation here with the Indians, and the left-handed batter that feels like, you know, given the opportunity to hit against left-handed pitchers, he's going to have some success against them. 
Wells trying to come out of the inning. Two down and a 2-2 count to Julio Franco. Franco 0 for 2 tonight. Breaking ball, full count. Times in his younger days, David Wells had some trouble controlling those emotions and keeping focused on the task at hand. Has he matured now at 32? I think so. He understands just basically how he's going to be successful on the mound. It's Franco to ground out to Roberto Alomar on to Palmero. Albert Belleville launches one off Wells, his third of the season, and the Indians have a two to one lead. The Orioles bottom of the sixth at Camden Yards. Jack McDowell against David Wells. Tonight's pitching summary brought to you by Sherwin Williams Paint and Wallpaper Stores. Both pitchers have struggled at times, but overall they've only allowed three runs between them. It's been a pretty dominant pitcher's night here tonight. They have six strikeouts between them. David Wells had retired nine straight until Albert Bell touched him up for that home run to put the Indians ahead. See how the Orioles respond here. It's a two-game series. We ringed out last night, so McDowell and David Wells had their starts pushed back to tonight, and Oral Hershiser and Scott Erickson will go tomorrow night. He had an off day with you. Because of that, though, the Orioles now only have one off day in the next three and a half weeks. It's changed their pitching plans a little bit. Rookie Jimmy Haynes will stay and make a start on the weekend instead of getting sent out to get a couple of starts in in the minors. Big cut by Bonilla, one and two. I have to believe before too long, Bobby Bonilla is going to make some adjustments with this pitching stance. It seems as though he's really fighting to keep that front foot in the air. Up the middle, backhanded by Bayerga. Two hopper to first, not in time. Bonilla beats it out. Well, Bayerga did a good job of getting to that ball but couldn't get much on the throw. You saw him look at his fingers. Well behind the bag at second, going away from first base, doesn't get much on the throw at all, and Bobby Bonilla is hustling down the line, beats that two hopper just by a half a step. Lead off man aboard for the Orioles, bottom of the sixth. The Indians took the lead in the top half of this inning. Baltimore trying to bounce back, and they've got the right part of the order at the plate to do it. Cal Ripken. Fly ball and a ground ball tonight. You think the lack of distraction this year is going to help him? I think so. Plus the added offense in the lineup with Alomar hitting two. Now Ripken can hit that fifth spot behind Bonilla. Then he's got Surhoff to protect him. Orioles have more weapons this year, and I think because of that, Ripken will be able to have much more success, not, in, not feeling the urge to really carry the offense. McDowell spots the fastball on the outside corner to Ripken. Second start of the season for McDowell. Took something off, one and two. Well, that's that fork ball that goes down and in to right-handed hitters. Had a lot of movement on it. Alomar was set up outside. That movement takes it to the inside, but it catches the inside corner. Dow has struck out four on the night. Two and two now to Ripken. Well, he has shown him fork balls breaking ball and one fastball on the outside corner. Nick Dow has an opportunity to come upstairs and inside with a fastball. He's had Ripken thinking down this entire attack. Missed outside. And with a fastball away. There has not been any activity in either bullpen at any point during tonight's game, but this is a big moment in this game right now. Bobby Bonilla at first, a full count to Ripken at the bottom of the sixth with the Orioles down a run. And the crowd sensing the importance of this at bat as Bonilla goes. It's strike three called. 
out at second is Benia. a big double play for the Indians. What a tag by the shortstop. Omar Vizquel really picked up Sandy Alomar to gun down Bobby Bonilla. The throw was on the shortstop side of the bag. Take a look at the pitch first of all. Ripken is caught looking at a fastball. Alomar's throw is to the shortstop side, but watch the tag. He scoops and tags all with the same motion. Chuck Merriweather, the umpire second base, brings up Bonilla. Boy, another example of what great defense will do for you. Now, B.J. Serha, suddenly two down, nobody on. Now, Ripken doesn't talk to umpires very often, but he did a little bit on this call. Well, it's high enough. Ripken didn't think it was over the plate, but you could see on that side angle that the ball was well above his knee. And he talked to Larry McCoy after the strikeout. He said it wasn't even close. But a strike him out, throw him out, erases that infield base hit by Bobby Bonilla. The 0-2 to Serha. Breaking ball, rounded down to first. Franco jogging over to first. He gets him. Vizquel, the big defensive play out around the bag, has preserved the Indians lead. For Camden Yards, the Indians lead the Orioles 2-1. We've talked about the potent offenses. We've talked about the great pitching. The defense is a big story. We've seen some good defense on both sides tonight. Well, we talked about the great defense of Omar Vizquel, the shortstop, and he really made a nice play on a steal attempt. Look at the throw from Alomar. It's on the shortstop side of the bag. He gloves the ball and swipes it, but Ian. It looks as though Bonilla may have beat the tag, but a great play by the shortstop to make the play and the tag all in the same motion. And overall, it's been a situation where Jack McDowell has really taken this sting out of the Orioles' bats. Just four hits and a single run so far. And that's exactly what the Indians had in mind when they signed Jack McDowell as a free agent in this offseason. Top of the seventh inning, the Indians hoping to extend their lead and win their third in a row. Started the season 0 and 3. Have won their last two. Danny Ramirez, bottom third of the order. Ramirez, Alomar, and Leyes. In the seventh inning for the Indians against David Wells. Both starters have gone the distance so far and pitched well. Ramirez is 0 for 2. One of the stories for the Indians in camp was Ramirez reported 29 pounds over his playing weight. They told him to get in shape, and by all accounts, talking to him, looking at him, he did. He rode a bike like crazy, and is supposedly back down here where he played last year. And all of these ball clubs have strength and conditioning coaches, and Fernando Montes, the strength and conditioning coach for the Indians, really got Ramirez in good shape in a short time. It's hard to imagine anybody putting that kind of weight on in the offseason, but Ramirez got himself ready for the season. Wells has popped Ramirez up, shallow center. Here comes Brady Anderson to make the catch. Let's go to Gary Miller. Dan Juan Guzman had a four-hit shutout going to the eighth, and Mike Aldretti hit a pinch hit homer to tie it at one, and now Garrett Anderson golfs one to center field, and it is out of the yard. His first home run in RBI of the year, the Angels have taken a 2-1 lead to the bottom of the ninth. Tim Pugh at Riverfront in a 7-all game. Two on for Jeff Kent with two out. He takes the curveball and wraps it. But Reggie Sanders comes in and makes the wheeling grab, and it's 7-all bottom of the sixth in Cincy. Back to you. First pitch swinging is Sandy Alomar, Palmero, but he slipped down there at first. Two quick outs in the inning for David Wells. Well, David Wells, when he keeps the ball on the ground, has really kept this Indians offense in check. But he got a fastball up to Albert Bell, and that has cost him the lead here. He trails 2-1. to one. Took him a while to get command, but he has done a pretty good job. Just six hits, but he possibly won that Albert Bell home run into the seats in the center. Bell, the only batter of the last 14. 
that Wells has not retired. Scott Leyes, fly ball, ground out. Play third base tonight for the Indians. Everything fell into place for the Indians last year, and again, the focus was on the offense. By far the best bullpen in the American League, maybe in baseball with Mason, company, and the veteran starters pretty much stayed healthy. Albert Bell had one of the best se offensive seasons in history. Dennis Martinez, Oral Hirschheiser, Charles Nagy, and now they've complimented those three with Jack McDowell. There weren't too many weaknesses in this Indian ball club last year, and they've even improved the club. Pretty good job for Mike Harvard, didn't you say? <laughs> Here's your team. Send them out. <laughs> well, we know the talk of 112 wins, or ho however many you want to speculate on. We know it's premature. Is it unrealistic? I don't know that it's unrealistic when you consider the season they had last year. I guess you could say the only real unbelievable year was the one Albert Bell put up, and there's no telling that he possibly can do that again. We're just finding out how good he is. Well, David Wells, with the exception of Bell, is just mowing him down. Another ground ball, 14 out of 15 set down. Hoyles, who's homered, will lead off the seventh. Two to one, Indians leading the Orioles in the seventh inning. The only Baltimore run coming off the bat of catcher Chris Hoyles. Catcher Chris Hoyles. No doubt about that one, a fastball. Hoyles hits his first home run of the season against Jack McDowell. McDowell was trying to get the ball inside and left it out over the plate. One of just four hits the Orioles have tonight against McDowell. Bottom third of the order, Baltimore coming up here in the seventh. Indians leading two to one, trying to make it three straight wins. And Hoyles went after the first pitch, popped it foul. Hoyles is perfectly suited for this ball park in that he doesn't have to pull the ball to hit it out. He can hit the ball out into the seats in center field, has good power to right center. That's the hitter's ball park. There's no doubt about it. 373 to the alley in right center. And then he's got that scoreboard that comes into play in right field. Oh, one pitch at the knees for strike two. And you can see the catchers on each side, Alomar and Hoyles, when they get one that goes against them at the plate, they shrug as if to say, well, hey, when I'm behind the plate, I'm going to I can see Hoyos didn't really argue an awful lot, but you could see him slump his shoulders and say, hey, man, I need that one, too. There's another one. Three pitches, and Hoyos is gone. Tony Tarasco advancing toward the plate. You see him bending down there. He is writing the initials CP into the dirt just outside the batter's box. CP for a friend of his, Chris Picking, who was killed several years ago in Santa Monica in gang-related activity. And during every at-bat, prior to every at-bat, Tarasco will remember his friend by inscribing his initials into the dirt just outside the batter's box. McDowell very high for ball two. Now McDowell falls behind. You can see the bullpen for Cleveland. Eric Punks, the right-hander. Jim Poole, a former Oriole, the left-hander. Very deep and effective bullpen for Mike Harper. McDowell threw 126 pitches his first time out. Mike Hargrove wasn't of the mind that he was going to let him throw that many, but he really kind of breezed through those 126. Now he's up to 107, but he's been laboring a little bit more here tonight, I think. Trying to fight back to the 3-0. Now a 3-1 count of Carrasco. One down to the Baltimore seventh, but he loses him. Ball four, fifth walk of the night given up by McDowell. 
Well, some would say this is an ALCS preview six months from now. Indians and Orioles, how about this game coming up? Brad McGriff and the World Series champion Atlanta Braves travel west to Los Angeles to take on Eric Karros, Mike Piazza, and the L.A. Dodgers. Part two of our doubleheader on ESPN Wednesday Night Baseball. This is some kind of doubleheader tonight. Very important signing by the Braves when they inked up Fred McGriff and Marquise Grissom both in the offseason. The batter, Jeffrey Hammonds. Graves, one of the halves, as opposed to the have announced in the major leagues. Didn't lose much, lost their fifth starter. Got a young guy, Jason Schmidt, that he tried to fill in the gap. And Berker steps up, presumably, to a, a bigger role here with the Orioles than he ever could have with the Braves. Now, even for the halves that we were talking about earlier, like Atlanta, they had to cut some salary. Mike Devereaux is there in Atlanta, and they went with Jason Smith in rotation, and Mike Devereaux and Nick Merker were cut loose. They actually traded Merker up here to Baltimore. David Johnson said he's got a mild concern about his club and that he doesn't have an awful lot of depth. But he knows he's got a general manager that will go out and make some deals and strengthen that bench of this ball club. Runner goes on the 0-2. Throw down and into center field. Lofton hustled in. Tarasco slid into second and could not advance any further. A stolen base for Tony Tarasco and a runner in scoring position for the Orioles. Alomar saw a big jump at first base by Carrasco, rushed his throw. Good lead, good jump. Alomar in a rush to gun down Carrasco. The ball takes off in the center field. Lofton is right on the time to keep Carrasco at second base. Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, out to talk to Alomar and McDowell here in this situation. Both Fork and Pool should be ready. They've been up and falling, even though it's a cool night here. They've had enough pitches to be loose now. A little encouragement from the pitching coach, and he says, okay, Jack, let's go after the number nine hitter right now. The left-hander Pool, the right-hander Plunk, looking on for the bullpen out of left center field. Dow's pitch count getting up there now, 111 on a very cool night in Baltimore. One down, runner at second. Carrasco after the walk in the stolen base. A one-two count on the number nine hitter, Jeffrey Hammonds. And a fourth ball missed inside. When Hammonds first came up with the Oreos, he showed that he could handle a breaking ball pretty well. He hasn't had enough regular at-bats because of injuries to really establish that, but that's a tendency we saw early. Swing and a miss. He got him. High fastball. Hammond swings right through it. McDowell has had good command of his fastball most of the night. He wanted it to the outside part of the plate, got it up around the letters, and Hammond swings through it. The leadoff man, Brady Anderson, up down. McDowell will stay. Two down in the inning. A potential tying run at second. And the person of Tony Tarasco. If Anderson gets on, I would expect to see Jim Poole face Robbie Alamon. I wouldn't expect Jack McDowell to face Alomar, who has really been a nemesis for him at this point in the ball game. with McDowell may be running out of gas a bit. There's Alomar on deck. We've talked about it throughout the course of the night. Alomar, 552 against McDowell with three home runs. Three walks tonight for Alomar. Alomar also a switch hitter much stronger from the left side. You bring in the left-hander pool, you turn Alomar around to his weaker side. First things first, though, a 2-0 count to Brady Anderson. 
Fouled off. McDowell still got good velocity on that fastball. Anderson had to count in his favor, but he was still behind it. Roy Percival getting the job done in the absence of Lee Smith for the Angels. It's not a bad insurance policy behind baseball's all-time save leader. 2-1 to Anderson. At the knees, strike two. Had one of those new low strikes right at the knees. McDowell knows he's only got a couple of more pitches to make. And he's reaching back for everything he has left in this situation. Trying to leave that base runner at second base and protect that one run lead. Carrasco, the leadoff second. Two down in the inning and the 2 2 to Anderson. Base hit up the middle. Carrasco around third. Lofton won't even throw home. This game is tied at two. Tony Carrasco stole second base and got himself in the scoring position. And then Brady Anderson, the leadoff batter, it's a pretty good pitch, a fastball away from him, right back, Jack, right back to Jack McDowell's glove side in the center. With two out, Carrasco got a great jump and scores easily. We've got a tie ball game. And we've got a pitching change as well. At the six and two thirds, Jack McDowell is done for the night. The left-hander Jim Rule will come in to face Roberto Alomar in a 2-2 game when we come back. Well, continues here at Camden Yards. Jack McDowell is done after the RBI single by Brady Anderson tied up the game to two. For McDowell, he really had to scrap and fight for this. Five walks, three of them to Roberto Alomar, and he leaves in a 2-2 tie. He had a pretty good pitch to Brady Anderson. The only one that he would really like to have back on sure is the home run to Chris Hoyles, but Anderson hit a tough pitch fastball away from him with two outs to chase Tony Carrasco. And with Robbie Alomar coming to the plate, left-handed Jim Poole comes on. Last year, very effective for the Indian 42 ball game, three and three record. Had an outstanding bullpen, best bullpen in the American League, anchored by Jose Mesa in his 46 saves, but they had a lot of key role players. Poole would come in to face a tough left-hander, switch around the switch hitter to his weaker side like he's doing right here to Alomar. But they've got three left-handers, three right-handers, and a very effective bullpen. Alomar, over the last five years, hitting 70 points higher from the left side than the right side. So the Indians will turn him around to his weaker side. Jack McDowell cannot win it. He can lose it with Brady Anderson, his responsibility, still out at first base. Bottom of the seventh inning here at Camden Yards. Better than 45,000 are seeing a whale of a ball game. It is 2-2. First, a threat to go. He stole the base in this game already. Pool to the plate. And Alomar takes a strike. Pool's one of those left handed pitchers. They won't almost power you, but he'll take something off, sink the ball down and away, then he'll run a breaking ball down and in on you. Never really gives you two pitches in the same location. There's a slider down in making only his second appearance of the season. He's faced only one batter. A week ago, he struck out Paul O'Neill of the Yankees with the bases loaded. Has pitched in seven days there. Anderson held on by Franco. Cool, a long look. And a throw over. Well, Poole's making Anderson wait, really taking a long time before he decides first or home. If you get a base runner and you make him wait, you can get edgy. Maybe you make the false step to a second. Out of the plate. Swung on and fouled off by Alomar. A ball and two strikes. There's a situation now where I think Brady Anderson's got a gamble. Remember, coming up next, the Braves and the Dodgers from the West Coast. 
We've got a whale of a game here tonight. 2-2 two -two in the seventh. Jack McDowell looking on anxiously after six and two thirds tough innings. Gave up only five hits, walked five, struck out seven. Anderson finished him with an RBI single to center field to score Tony Carrasco. trying to endear himself to the hometown fans. Roberto Alomar. Brady's caught. Gets back, though. Fool's very tough to get a jump on because he waits so long and actually began his move. Anderson was on his way to second. Fool hung up and goes to first base. Anderson just barely gets his hand back in time. Line to center field, but Kenny Lofton is there. And that'll do it for the Orioles in the seven. They tie the game on the Brady Anderson single. Kenny Lofton will lead it off for Cleveland when we come back. Baseball still to be played here in Baltimore. Two twos to score, top of the eighth inning. Jack McDowell got some help from the bullpen to keep this game tied. Yeah, Jim Poole came on to retire Robbie Alomar and strand one of Jack McDowell's base runners. Overall, real good outing for Jack McDowell, holding the Orioles to just five hits. An RBI base hit by Brady Anderson tied the score in the bottom of the seventh, and now Wells is set to work to Lofton here in the eighth. Lofton will take a strike from Wells. Kenny Lofton, two for three tonight, couple of singles, stolen a base, his sixth of the season, 256th. As a Cleveland Indian, the all-time Indians record holder in that department. Big batter for David Wells here in the eighth inning. This scaled and the big boys by Erga, Bell, Murray. Coming up middle of the order. High with a fastball, two and one. We mentioned earlier that Kenny Lofton was the igniter of this offense, and of course, this is a very important out for David Wells in this 2 2 ball game in the eighth. Fastball fouled off two and two. David Wells working in the eighth inning. Roger McDowell behind him, loosening up. McDowell coming over from the Texas Rangers to beef up this Orioles staff. And Pat Gillick was very busy in the offseason, making sure Davey Johnson had all the ingredients to make a run at the American League East title. Wells has given up six hits through seven, working on Lofton here in the eighth. And he gets it with a fastball. Well, Yogi Berra said many years ago, you can't think and hit. And right here, it looks like Kenny Lofton was thinking breaking ball. David Wells crosses him up, comes with a fastball, and it's a big out. First out of the eighth inning. In between. Wasn't really sure what he was going to get from David Wells. Omar Vizquel tries to bunt his way on. It hugs the line and finally rolls foul. David Wells has been on a roll with the exception of the Albert Bell home run in the sixth inning that at the time gave the Indians a two to one lead. That's the only blemish on that number right there. 15 of 16 set down by David Wells. The Indians had him on the ropes in the first inning. He allowed three hits and a walk in that first inning, but they couldn't score. Albert Bell, an infield single in the first and that home run in the sixth. He's got two of the six hits off of David Wells. Well, need somebody in front of him to get on to get it at bat this inning. Vizquel chops one down to third. Serhoff gets a two down. We've been talking about Ripken and Alomar defensively, but T.J. Serhoff has had a fine knot with the glove. He's in, looking for the bunt from Vizquel. Goes high and takes a big bounding ball easily across the infield for the out.
got to help DJ an awful lot to have Ripken on his left, helping him out with positioning. Here's Carlos Baerga with two down and nobody on. Strike one from Wells. He doesn't seem to be faltering at all here in the eighth inning. Baerg has been one of the few Indians to have any luck against him tonight. Pulled the ball down into the left field corner for an RBI double back to the third. That was the Indians' first run of the game. Also has a base hit and a ground ball. One and one outside off the plate. And the RBI double that Baerg hit off Wells earlier was a good fastball. It might have been low on the inner part of the plate. But he got down and got to it. The impressive thing about that double down the left field line was that he kept the fence. Viagra didn't want to swing at that, one and two. Well, that was a pretty ugly swing, wasn't it? <laughs> he got it going at the fastball, tried to check his swing, and all he could do was foul it out of play. That's not your typical Carlos Viagra hack at all. Unlike Alomar, Baerga pretty consistent from both sides of the play. Wells ahead of him, a ball and two strikes. A 2-2 game in the eighth here in Baltimore. And this pivotal pitch right here, this time instead of trying to make a perfect pitch inside, David Wells and Chris Hoyles decided to go outside, and you could see Baerga really had to reach for that ball to foul it off. Well, still up at 90 miles an hour on that pitch. I got a bounce of breaking ball here right now. One and two. Baerga has been swinging at everything from well. Breaking ball, but he didn't bounce it. But he got a ground ball right back to him. David Wells has set down at 17 of the last 18 he's faced. Orioles coming up in a 2-2 tie. Thank you. We do have a great one going here. 2-2, and David Wells maybe didn't get the acclaim of the Roberto Alomars and some of the other players who came over here to Baltimore, but 16-game winner last year. Boy, can he help this rotation? Well, he's been outstanding tonight. 112 pitches through eight innings. He's had good command. He had some trouble in the first inning, but a double play helped him out as he gave up three hits and a walk with no runs in that first inning. But the Indians left-hander Jim Poole on the mound. He came in. He got Roberto Alomar to line out to center field, ending the Orioles' threat in the seventh. He'll face the left-hand hitting Rafael Palmeiro. Lead off the eighth inning. Palmeiro followed by Bonilla, a switch hitter, and then Cal Ripken inside the ball. Julian Tavares, the hard-throwing right-hander, begins to loosen up for Mike Hargrove down in the Indians' bullpen. And Poole has missed badly with each of his last two pitches to fall behind 3-0. You can see Alomar set up outside. Poole misses off the plate inside, and he missed his target by about three feet. had very good success against Paul Merrill. Rafael is 0 for 9 against him in his career. There for a strike, 3 and 1. This is a guy made for this ballpark. Power numbers have really come up. Fly ball, left center field, Lofton settling under it. One down. Now that ball was a bit away from Paul Mayer. He had to reach for it. Not the one he really wanted to swing at that situation. Oh, fell behind 3-0, but then came back with a couple of good pitches, and Paul Mayer lifts the lazy fly to center and slaps his bat away in disgust. The skipper, Mike Hargrove, is out. That's it for Jim Poole. The right-hander, Julian Tavares, will come on to face Bobby Bonilla when we come back. 
five here in Baltimore tonight. A 2-2 tie in the bottom of the eighth inning at Camden Yards. Time now for the Kelly Springfield tire. Key plays of the game. A 1-1 tie in the sixth inning. And Albert Bell just hammers one to right center field. His third home run in the inning his last two games. 2-1 Cleveland. But then at the bottom of the seventh, the runner at second, Tony Tarasco. Brady Anderson, a base hit up the middle. Tarasco rounds third and scores to tie the game up with two. Both starters have since left the game and in the bottom of the eighth inning in an early season matchup between the Indians and Orioles. It's a 2-2 tie. Mike Hargrove goes to his bullpen again, this time for the right-hander. Julian Taveras working in his fourth game of this young season. ERA at 2.08. Ten wins last year for Taveras and he's a fastball specialist. He'll come right at you. Very hard throwing right hander. He's put on some weight, gotten stronger, and they believe that he'll be even more effective this year. Much more confident young man. Jim Poole did his job to tie the two batters he faced. Three good batters in Robbie Alomar and Rafael Palmero. He's stranded and inherited runner for Jack McDowell, and Tavares will come on to face Bobby Bonilla. Bonilla DHing again tonight. Base hit, a walk, and a ground ball. Doesn't have a lot of experience against Tavares, just in the second year Tavares is in the majors. Bonilla's faced him twice. Tavares has gotten them both times, once by strikeout. One down in the bottom of the eighth and a 2-2 tie. The starters, Jack McDowell and David Wells have left the game both pitched well, especially David Wells for the Orioles. to Benia. Put the 0 and 2. Well, what a tough sequence for Bobby Benia to deal with. First pitch changeup, second pitch 90 mile an hour fastball moving away from him. Another changeup. You mentioned the depth of the Cleveland bullpen. We've seen Jim Poole and now Julian Tavares. They, of course, have Mesa, the big guy, 46 saves, 48 chances last year. Paul Ossenmacher, one of three lefties, along with Poole and Alan Embry, who can really bring it. Bonilla lines one down to first, caught by Franco, two down. Bonilla gets on a Tavares fastball here and makes a bid for extra bases down the first base line, but look at the glove work by Franco. A shot off the battle, but Ia turns into the second out of the inning. Tavares with that good fastball. This time, Bonilla caught up to it, but gets some defensive help from his first baseman, Julio Franco. No problem for Julio. Today, I want a gold glove in the panel. The batter, Cal Ripken. Ripken struck out looking last time up and didn't like it. That's some words for home plate umpire Larry McCoy. Ripken one for four in his career against Tavares with a home run. He lines one sharply foul down the left field side, 0-2. Well, they're lucky Ripken got out in front of that breaking ball. They wanted that pitch away. And Tavares left it right over the heart of the plate. Look at a target from the catcher. It's away, but he hangs it and rips it with all over it, but hooks it foul. There's a mistake that Tavares got away with. The 0-2. How about that? Ripken might have had a few more words for Larry McCoy on what was a very close pitch. Now this time, Alomar is way off the plate outside, and that's a similar pitch to the one that McCoy called him out on, and the umpire gave it a little extra look there. This Not time, he's gone. Second time in a row, Cal Ripken's been caught looking. We're through eight in a 2-2 tie at Camden Yards. Knows how long this one's going to go. Cal Ripken strikes out for the second time tonight. 2-2 through eight, and Ripken again. He's still muttering to himself. He's not happy with the call. Well, he was called out earlier in the game on a fastball away. This pitch just a few inches outside for Larry McCoy, but they come right back to the same spot. 
And this time, the movement brings it back over the outside corner, and McCoy rings up Cal Ripken for the second consecutive at bat. You can see it has plenty of height. Ripken just thinks it's outside. You don't see this very often from Cal Ripken. Well, he stayed a long time around home plate, too. First of all, he was talking to McCoy's back, and then the umpire turns around, and he continues to voice his displeasure with the call. Tavares made a couple of close pitches, and Lipton felt that the second one that he was run up on was outside. Once again, that Indian's bullpen coming through for Mike Hargrove. Poole retired the two batters he was faced with, and then Tavares comes on and gets... Bonilla and Ripken. And now coming on in relief for the Orioles, yet another new pickup, Roger McDowell. He'll make his third appearance of the young season and right in the middle of things. Bell, Murray, and Franco here in the ninth inning of a 2 2 tie. Albert Bell, solo home run to center off David Wells on Sunday. He hit two against Toronto. The 1-0. Left it out over the plate. Bell didn't get it. 1-1. One one. Tough guy to hit a home run off Roger McDowell. He leads all active major leaguers in fewest home runs per nine innings. Ground ball to short. Ripken plays it on the first, and a very dangerous hitter is retired. It's tough to get that Roger McDowell sinker airborne. He's really got a nasty bite on it, and Bell beat it on the ground to shortstop. When you're playing the Orioles, that's pretty much a standard 6 3. Now, Eddie Murray continues to search for base hits in the early going this season. Two for 19. Do a walk tonight as well. For the first time tonight, hitting left-handed. David Wells went the first eight innings for the Orioles. Murray's had very good success against McDowell over the course of his career. Six for ten lifetime. Most of that coming in the National League. The 0-1. Ground ball for Alamar. Two down. And that's what Roger McDowell does so effectively is put the ball on the ground in this ballpark with this defense. That's going to give him a lot of effective innings. Johnson and McDowell, of course, worked together in 1986. Part of that Miracle Mets team. McDowell had 14 wins and 22 saves for Davy Johnson. Julio Franco backs up to take a look at it. He takes strike one. The Indians certainly getting a message from the Orioles tonight that they're not just going to walk through the American League this year. Good pitching performance from David Wells. The Orioles picking up not only some good pitchers in Wells and McDowell and Myers. That's some characters, too, on this team. This is the whole personality of this team has changed all of a sudden. All you need to hear about David Wells is when he's pitching, starting pitcher gets his choice of music in the clubhouse. If you're anywhere within about three miles of Camden Yards, you'll know if David Wells has started. Loud, heavy metal music. <laughs> For so many years, you'd walk in the Orioles clubhouse and you felt like you had to whisper. Boy, it was different there today. Music blaring, lots of things going on. McDowell was talking to everybody. They were even putting a ping pong table together. <laughs> Pretty unsuccessfully when we were in there. They were, they were having all kinds of trouble with that thing. It was at about six pieces. Somebody lost their direction. <laughs> well, that's the last thing you would ever imagine from an Orioles clubhouse at Ping Pong Table. Pretty loose ball club under Davy Johnson here this year. Don't 
forget, second half of the doubleheader, the Braves and the Dodgers coming up immediately following this game here at Camden Yards. The 2-2, and he got him. And Franco knew it. Bottom of the ninth, the Orioles have a chance to win. B.J. Surhoff, Chris Hoyles, and Tony Tarasco getting set to go. Terrific game here in the bottom of the ninth inning at Camden Yards. Indians and the Orioles are tied at two. The defending champions of the American League, the Cleveland Indians, have swaggered into Baltimore. And the Orioles haven't given them an inch tonight. A 2-2 tie. Both starters, Jack McDowell, David Wells are gone. Both pitch well. Wells is terrific. Retired 17 of the last 18 he faced. And in the bottom of the ninth, the Orioles have a chance to win it. With B.J. Surhoff leading it off against Cleveland reliever Julian Tavares. for Mike Hargrove. Hargrove's well aware that everybody in the American League is coming after the Indians after the great season they had last year. The Orioles went out and beefed up their club. They're anxious to turn around their record last year against Cleveland. Two and ten. Cleveland just warm out. The Orioles had such a disappointing 95. Finished below 500. Now three and one. Surhoff, another one of the new players. Tomorrow night, these two teams will meet again. Orioles, Scott Erickson, Davy Johnson wants to take care of business tonight. On the corner, full count to Surhoff. Larry McCoy's not the most popular guy in the ballpark. That is a fastball with good movement. Alomar does a good job to give McCoy a good look. Surhoff doesn't agree. But McCoy's had a wide strike zone all night long for both sides. Now Ripken struck out twice looking. Argued both times. Big cut by Surhoff and Tavares has struck him out. 93 miles an hour. The fastball for Julian Tavares. Chris Hoyles, the catcher, stepping in. He's responsible for one of the two Baltimore runs tonight. A fourth inning home run off Jack McDowell. Deep into the seats in left field, his first of the year. That tied the game at one. He certainly has the power to end the game with one swing. Fair ball. Alomar. And dropped by Franco as he had to reach into the line where Hoyles was charging across the base. Franco heard some big footsteps coming down the line. And Hoyles is safe at first. That's a tough play for even a veteran first baseman when you've got to reach into that baseline and make a play. Alomar threw from the knees and there was a big tailing action on that ball. Big swinging front by Chris Hoyles here. The catcher comes out, slides to his knees, and then throws to first base, but the ball runs on him. You can see Franca was preoccupied with the big catcher moving down the first baseline and let the ball go off the end of his glove. Manny Alexander in the run for Hoyles at first. It's been scored an error on Julio Franca. First, Alexander, the pinch runner, the batter, Tony Tarasco. Tavares from the stretch, misses down and away. Tarasco picked up in a deal from the Expos. Going right field tonight. It's one to left field. This is a long run for Albert Bell. He's there in time to make the catch and hustling back to first on the play is Alexander. Albert Bell had a long run over to the quarter in left field. Danny Alexander, the runner at first base, goes all the way around the back. Look how far Bell has to run and makes the catch just before he gets onto the warning track to retire Tarasco. 
Alexander had to scamper back to first base, but now there are two down. And Tavares will get set to work for the Orioles' number nine hitter. The left fielder, Jeffrey Hammond. Two down in the inning, a pinch runner, Manny Alexander at first. Not going, and Hammonds will take a strike. These are the games in which Mike Hargrove, I'm sure, has some concern about his defense, particularly in the outfield. Close games, late in the ball game. Foul down the left field line. 0-2 on Jeffrey Hammonds. Hargrove is kind of hamstrung in that he can't make defensive changes for these guys because they're so good offensively. And if you go into extra innings, you want to make sure you have their bats in the lineup. Tavares sets. This is high, one and two. And it's 0 for 3 on the night. There goes the runner. Throw down and out at second is Jeffrey Hammonds as it bounced in, but Bayerga came up with it and made the play. On that note, we're headed to extra innings at Camden Yards. The Indians and the Orioles are all tied up at two. Here, extra innings, top of the tenth inning. Sandy Alomar throws out the pinch runner, Manny Alexander, to send this game into extra innings on a very close play at second. Now look at the glove work by Bayerga. Alomar's throw is in front of the bag at second base. Bayerga digs it out and then goes down and tags Alexander just before he hits second base. Chuck Merriweather was right on top of the play. Davey Johnson came out to argue after the out, but Merriweather made a good call on a close play at second. Roger McDowell in his second inning of work. And the Orioles bullpen he came on after eight complete. He'll face the bottom third of the order for the Indians. Manny Ramirez, Sandy Alomar, and Scott Lais. Ramirez's foot, one and two. With Hoyles out of the game for the pinch runner, Alexander, Greg Zahn is coming to catch here in the tenth inning. David Johnson made the move to the pinch runner. He still has an emergency catcher in B.J. Sirhoff should something happen to Zahn. It's a luxury not an awful lot of managers have. But he's got an experienced major league catcher in his third baseman. Ramirez, two hopper down to short. Cleaned up by Ripken, on down. Alomar and Ripken exchanging information. Roger McDowell has faced four batters, three ground ball out. Now to catch with Sandy Alomar. This part of the order tonight for the Indians has really struggled. Five through nine are a collective 0 for 17. The Indians have just six hits on the night. Austin with two, Bayerga with two, and Bell with two. Roger McDowell facing Sandy Alomar, a 1-1 count. If you believe in omens, let's give you one in favor of the Indians in their tremendous 1995 season. They were 13-0 in extra inning ball games. That tells you what kind of bullpen they had because they were able to shut down their opponents in those extra inning games and give the offense a chance to win it late. 1-2, slash down the right field line. Jim Tomey, who didn't start against the left-hander David Wells, grabs his bat. He's going to loosen up and sitting for Scott Leyes. 
Dallas has tired all four Indians who face. The one-two count here on Sandy Alomar. Alomar loops one into left field. Here comes Hammonds, and he makes a sliding catch. Davey Johnson is gone with two young outfielders at the corners in Hammonds and left and Tarasco and right. And right here, Hammonds uses good speed to come over and take off, take away a base hit from Sandy Alomar. Left field is a tough position for any outfielder because of all the different spins and slices of the balls. Alomar got jammed on that fastball from McDowell. A nice sliding catch by Jeffrey Hammonds. Now Davey Johnson heading to the mound for Roger McDowell, it appears. The left-hander, Tony, coming up. He's already signaled for the change. We'll have a new pitcher and a pinch hitter in extra innings when we come back to Camden Yards. All games here in the early going. Here's the next man, Roger McDowell, who certainly did the job, retired all five hitters he faced, and he will give way to yet another expat who played under Davey Johnson. Jesse Orozco on here to face pinch hitter Jim Tony. Now Davey Johnson has the luxury of a pretty deep bullpen himself and he calls upon Jesse Orozco who had a great season for the Orioles last year. 28 hits in almost 50 innings. And one thing Orozco has done late in his career is he's become very effective at neutralizing left-handed hitters. He had McDowell come in and really throw up some zeros against the Indians 0 for 5. And now he calls upon Orozco to face the pinch hitter, Jim Tomey. Tomey just hasn't had a sniff against Orozco. The Oriole pitching staff has set down 22 of the last 23 Cleveland hitters. The only exception, Albert Bell, who homered in the sixth, Give the Indians at the time a two to one lead. Now two two top of the tenth, two down. Tommy against Orozco. Orozco has become more effective against left-handed batters the last couple of years because of a big sweeping breaking ball. He's been able to start it at those left-handed hitters and then break it down and away from them. Right there. Now he's got Jim Tommy really trying to hang in there and keep that front side from flying open and it's tough to do with that three-quarter delivery from Orozco especially when you've been sitting in the cold for four hours and haven't been in the ball game go on one to Tony fastball high ball two. more depth in the Indians bullpen the closer, Jose Mesa, the right-hander, Paul Ossermacher, like Orozco, very effective against left-handed batters. The 2-1. Just outside with a breaking ball, ball three. And those who have remained, and just about everybody's remained, thought that was strike two. Well, Larry McCoy has called pitches to both sides of the plate all night long, but felt that that breaking ball was off the plate. behind three and one this one breaks over the inside corner and now it's Tommy with a thought or two nobody's happy tonight <laughs> <laughs> this breaking ball starts at Tommy he gives up on it I don't think he had a real good look at it McCoy calls the inside Tommy's gonna get another breaking ball here Still count. he got one fouled it off Deck, another left-hand hitter in Kenny Lofton, who's got a couple of hits in tonight's game already. Jim Tomey trying to keep the inning going. Give Lofton it at bat. Pinch hitting for Scott Leyes, top of the 10th inning. Cleveland 2, Baltimore 2. Ball 4. Now 
Thompson. Do you like many left-hand hitters struggling against Orozco? One for six in his career. A couple of singles off David Wells, the starter for the Orioles in this game. And he went up there hacking, fouling off the first pitch. That's not a bad approach against Jesse Orozco for Kenny Lofton, figuring that he was going to go ahead and get that first pitch fastball, try to put it in play. Now he knows he's going to have to fight that big sweeping breaking ball. Tommy probably not a big threat to be going anywhere at first base. Palmero edges off the bag and now retreats as Orozco throws over. game this would be a real nice win for the Baltimore Orioles first time they faced the Indians this year after losing 10 out of 12 to Cleveland in 1995 before a capacity crowd two and one the Roscoe slipped a bit on that mound as he delivered that pitch to the plate it's the first time I've really noticed the pitcher having problem with his footing but watch his left leg as it comes around he just lost his footing as he followed through on that pitch breaking ball inside for ball three Orozco struggling with his control too might be a little preoccupied now after slipping that one time he went behind the mound and kicked the dirt out of his spikes There is no activity in the Oriole bullpen. 3-1 pitch to Lofton. Now full count. Orioles are a little bit short-handed in the bullpen. Armando Benitez, a big right-hander, has some elbow trouble. He's going to throw on the side tomorrow, and they hope that he'll come around so that they can get him back in there. He's pitched only one inning so far this season. Of course, Randy Myers is out there. They've got a young right-hander, Jimmy Myers, out of the bullpen as well. Arthur Rhodes, who's not 100% right now, so really it might be just Randy Myers and Jimmy Myers available to Davey Johnson here in extra innings. So for the meantime, with a left-hander up, and then Vizquel and Baerga should loft and extend the inning. This is Jesse Orozco's ballgame. Hopper down to second. Speared by Alomar. He'll throw out Lofton. And that's it for the Indians in the top of the ten. Coming up, Jeffrey Hammonds, Brady Anderson, Roberto Alomar. It should be a terrific game for the Braves and Dodgers. We'll send you there as soon as this game is over. Indians and Orioles, bottom of the tenth inning here at Camden Yards. Jim Tomey, pinch hit in the top half of the inning for Scott Leyes. Stays in the game at third base. And into his third inning of work is Julian Tavares to face the number nine hitter Jeffrey Hammonds. And now Tavares' buck slips on the mound. Now he lost his footing just like a roster in the top half of this game. We had a little bit of rain earlier in the evening. This game started about 15 minutes late. Last night's game was rained out. It was very cold. There were some snow flurries in the area. It's clear but cold now. The teams will go back at it again tomorrow night. Finish off a two-game series. The 2-1 to Hammonds. Down and away ball three. 
for Jose Mesa, Paul Asenmacher were both up for the Indians a few minutes ago. Tavares does have the stamina to go more than just a couple of innings. He's in his third inning right now. Asenmacher continues to work. Hammonds lines one down the left field line. Fair ball. Extra bases for Jeffrey Hammonds. Albert Bell picks it up in the corner, and Hammonds is at second with a leadoff double. Number nine hitter Jeffrey Hammonds gets out in front of a fastball and hooks it down the left field line. Albert Bell goes over into the corner and digs it out. But the Orioles have the winning run on base, Jeffrey Hammonds, with his first hit of the night, a leadoff double here in the 10th. Hargrove making sure Paul Ossenmacher is ready. Now makes the slow walk to the mound. He's had Ossenmacher up and throwing. And we talked about the depth of this Indian bullpen. It appears as though Hargrove's going to test it. A similar situation to the one in the seventh inning when Jim Poole came in. That time, Hargrove left his starter, Jack McDowell, to face Brady Anderson, and it cost him with an RBI single. Now it'll be lefty against lefty with the winning run in second. Lead-off double to Jeffrey Hammonds here at the bottom of the 10th inning. You can see how even this game has been. He's needed two runs on six hits. Hammonds, the big double, and that's brought on yet another reliever. And it's another left-hander. Paul Ossenmacher comes in to face Brady Anderson. This will be his fourth game of the season. You can see he's a specialty guy. Just an inning and two-thirds in those three outings. Big, sweeping, grazing ball. Got a little more velocity than Jesse Orozco in a nasty, great pitch. He's on in a situation now with the leadoff batter Jeffrey Hammond at second base where the Orioles can play run him over to third, set the table for Alomar, Palmera, and Bonilla. Toby Hara moving the infield defense around. Brady Anderson's had a good night. What you want to do if you're going to bunt is draw that third baseman away from the bag. Anderson wants to put the ball on the ground to Tomei. Remember, Jim Tomey came into the game as a pinch hitter in the ninth inning. He has been cold and loose. It's a cold, damp night. The grass is wet. Lots of things can happen if he has to make a defensive play here. Shortened up at first base. That's Franco. Hammonds at second with good speed. Anderson, the batter. Bottom of the tenth. Nobody out. Twice the Indians have led, twice the Orioles have tied it up. Now trying to win it in the 10. Anderson has to back away from that. He did square to bunt, but he just had to get out of the way. Now 2-0. First pitch was a breaking ball. Second one's up and in, and he has to duck out of the way. His job now, obviously, is to put the ball on the ground and move Jeffrey Hammonds over to third base. Ossenbacher hasn't been close on his first two pitches. Hammonds the runner at second. Bunch it foul, two and one. And he was trying to go down the third base line. Well, you do that because you want to draw Tomei away from the bag. Give Hammonds an easy shot at going over to third base. I mentioned Tomei, a defensive. This is his first inning of defense. He came on as a pinch hitter. Hammonds with good speed at second base. He can't stray too far off the bag at second because Alomar has got a good gun behind the plate. Got to make sure Anderson puts the ball on the ground before he makes a move. Hugs the line, stays fair. They'll get Anderson at first, but the sacrifice moves the winning run, Jeffrey Hammonds, down to third base. Nothing Alomar could do with that other than get the out at first. A perfect butt by Brady Anderson. 
right on the end of the bat and he really kills it and then it dies inside the foul line Alomar goes to Baerga for the out with Hammonds at third base Alomar is going to get the intentional pass the on deck hitter is Rafael Palmeira left hand hitter behind him Bobby Bonilla the switch hitter all good hitters Not very many happy options for my car bro. Brady Anderson did his job moving Hammonds down to third and really forcing the hand of the Indians well so many bad things happen to you when you're on defense and the leadoff batter hits a double in the tenth inning then Brady Anderson with a perfect sacrifice Sam Palazzo giving Hammond some instruction Two for 12 with two strikeouts. That's Palmero's record against Eisenbacher. That's why Hargrove put Bobby Alomar at first base. Tavares looking for some help from his bullpen made Eisenbacher. And they'll pitch to Palmero. One down, runners on the corner. And a strike from Eisenbacher. Up the middle, Fiskell and Baerga are looking for two. Alomar is really going to be aggressive trying to break up anything on the ground. Palmero with a chance to win it for Baltimore here in the tent. He's one for four on the night. Lefty against lefty, Asenmacher. With the 1-1. One, one. Did he go? Yes, he did. On the field, Jim Evans says it's strike two. Boy, Alomar was really adamant. He couldn't get his mask off to argue with the umpire, but he knew that Palmero went around. He is way out in front. Alomar said, get the appeal. Ask him. And he got the call from Jim Evans at third base. Hammonds at third, Alomar at first, Asenmacher ahead of Palmero, one and two. Up and in, almost hit him as Palmero was leaning into it with a big ball, too. Alomar got crossed up. That's why he was so late getting to that pitch. Now he's going to talk to Asenmacher about it. Watch how he reacts. He's expecting this ball to be down, and then he goes just barely, gets the glove on the ball. That saved the game for the time being. Hammonds is lead at third. Roberto Alomar over at first on the intentional walk. He didn't really cut loose that throw to first, did he? <laughs> A tense moment for the Indians. really feel like April, does it? Two good ball clubs and extra innings as Roberto Alomar goes and Palmero lines one down into the right field corner and this ball game is over. Jeffrey Hammonds 
Paul Ostenmacher gave up the eventual game-winning double to Rafael Palmeiro. As the Orioles beat the Indians 3-2 in 10 innings, the Indians did lose an extra inning game all of 1995, going 13-0. They've lost one here. The winner is Orozco. The loser is Tavares. The Orioles beat the Indians 3-2 in 10 innings here at Camden Yards. Now let's send you to Dwayne Stats and Dave Campbell.